I was going to meet him and talk about you know, making this first quarter. And this jacked up dude that I don't know op- swings the door open and points a shotgun at us through the burglar bar door and starts screaming at us, what are you mother doing here? And blah, 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 you know, blah. So I'm trying to talk everybody down against one of those deals where how am I going to explain this? Or we're going to have to shoot somebody and I'm here and nobody knows I'm here. That scared me to death. What's up, guys? On today's episode, we interviewed an undercover cop. Tegan Broadwater is a former Dallas narcotics cop who went deep undercover and infiltrated the most infamous Crip gang set in Dallas Fort Worth. He embedded with Crip gang members for 18 months before his police work finally led to a 51 man RICO indictment. He's here to tell us how a white guy was able to assimilate and move up within the ranks of the Crips, finally taking down the kingpin and causing this massive bust. You can go buy Tegan's book. He wrote a book about it called Life in the Fishbowl. Go to Amazon right now. You can also follow his YouTube page. And of course, if you want bonus content with Tegan, go over to patreon.com slash the connect show. You're going to love this episode. Without further ado, Tegan Broadwater right here on The Connect with Johnny Mitchell. So we get in there and the first thing happens, we unlock the burglar bar, open the door, step in. It's a typical trap. You know, you got a couch, a table with some weights and a gun and then a big screen TV. And no sooner did we start having a conversation about what he had, I hear something eerily familiar. And it just so happens to be my own voice on an episode of Cops from... 1999. That's when I see the lights behind me start to flash. And I didn't even think, I just hit it. I was driving like my life depended on it. Then I parked the car, hopped out, closed the door, and I started running. And he pulls out a burner, a shank, it's like six inches. And then he passes it to me. And he goes, here, that's yours. Don't ever leave the cell block without this. He was the reason I made it out of that place alive. You're the first Texas lawman that we've had on this show. Oh, I hope I rep well, but I don't think I'd I assimilate as as well as some, but happy to be here either way. You know, Texas, as it was formed, is an extremely lawless place. Do you go back? Does your family go back in in Texas, or did you guys immigrate there? Uh, I don't actually know. You you don't find my DNA in any of the sites. (laughs) Right, right. I don't know. I had an uncle that went did, did a bunch of digging, but I'm not actually... I, we're not from Texas originally, even even my immediate family. Okay. Do you have law enforcement over there. in your family? None. Why did you want to be a cop or when, at what age did you decide? Um, interestingly enough, uh, I was playing, I was a musician by profession. I went to college for music and everything else. <laughs> Typical and, way you become a cop. Right. None of this stuff is going to be terribly obvious. Again, <laughs> my representation is questionable. But I used to play th- this gig on the side and- so many cops used to come out and see us. They just followed us everywhere we went. So I got to know all these cops. What were you playing? I was playing drums at the time. Huh. And again, I went to school for music. So I played, you know, a number of different instruments and stuff. But at the time, we were, it was just a, you know, rhythm and blues type of gig mm-hmm. or something. Um, and then, you know, when, when it came time that I got super frustrated with the music industry itself, I still loved music and playing music, but I was just frustrated with playing a bunch of clubs in Oklahoma City that uh, Cokehead needed you to bring 500 people or this yes. and that. It just, it's a, it was a beating. I know mm-hmm. you know this. Th- Heavy shows, work. we call them. <laughs> yes. And comedy. Those are your first five years of comedy. You yes. got to get 10 friends out to do yeah. three minutes. It is. It, and look, I know it is what it is. And I know it was a money deal, but some of these dudes were just crooks anyway. So it was just frustrating mm-hmm. uh, that they talked me into entertaining law enforcement. So I thought, you know, it would be kind of cool, you know, to sign up for SWAT or something, you know, it'd be kind of fun. So I asked if I could do that. Of course you can't, but, uh, and I had no business anyway. I'd never been fired a gun before. Mm. I was a musician. I was, you know, I I was quite good at breaking up fights and talking people out of having fights up to that point. Yeah. Um, And then I had, uh, my brother and I got assaulted also. And I was, we were at a club and I was trying to find a bass player to audition and a bunch of frat dudes were coming in the doors. I'm going out the door, just trying to squeeze by or whatever. And they just kind of, you know, mob mug me and uh, followed us out to the car and started talking about the crap. You know, 10 dudes surrounded my brother and I'm thinking, man, this is pretty unfair. You guys are sorry. So I jump into, I managed to jump in the car and tried to let him in. But, you know, I had one of those old Corsicas with a, uh, 
lock that was not automatic. So I had to reach across and try to let him in. They snatched a hold of him. So I had to get back out. You know, they got a hold of a bunch, a bunch of people. So we ended up kind of sign languaging one another and managed to get the other door open. And he made a break for it, jumped in the car. And they started smashing all the windows, kicking in the sides of the doors. It was just, it was just a bunch of. That's old Texas lynching man, behavior. It was ridiculous. White Such boys? A, yeah. Just a bunch of white. Now, if you had pulled out, if you would, if you were carrying, right, like Mm -hmm. many people in Texas do, Mm -hmm. obviously, I think like almost exclusively, uh, and you had shot one of them and killed them, what kind of law either protects you or prosecutes you for that? Like, is there stand your ground the way there is there in is. Florida? Yeah, there is. But you have a lot of articulating to do at that point. But I think it's articulable because, first of all, if you have a gun legally and then you're getting jumped and beat by 10 different people, then essentially they now also have a gun because you're not going to kung fu spin around, kick everybody's butt, and then drive yeah. off yeah. safely. Because 10 on 2 is like having a gun. It's like a loaded gun It's not going to work out. Face. Yeah. So yeah. if I'm unconscious with a gun, then uh-huh. essentially now they have a gun. And so you have to make a snap judgment. But mm. all that has to be articulable after the fact, which always makes it interesting, even in law enforcement. You know, when you get into big skirmishes and fights and stuff, and people are critical of how, man, they kind of got together and were talking and trying to get their story straight. But I mean, and I know you've been in fights too. When you've been in a fight and you five minutes later have to give a blow by blow, it kind of takes a little time for you to remember how this went down Mm -hmm. because it was a big surprise. The dude starts swinging. We went here, but you have to be very descriptive when you're writing a report or defending yourself in a court. So you would need some time to be sure you could articulate every move and at what point you justified having to pull that thing. Because obviously you're not thinking a lot during that time. You're Mm -hmm. reacting. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The the South is fascinating because in certain cir- certain circumstances, they will let somebody who really <clears throat> over defended themselves and, you know, pulled what, what's essentially negligent homicide or manslaughter and let them off scot free. And then we've talked to people on this show and in the course of doing this who very justly defended themselves against what would have been death and they got railroaded into prison. I know. I think it's it's county to county, state to state. Right. It's, it's not consistent though. Right. Do you think, you know, you were telling me that you tell me you run a private company that's mm-hmm. essentially an armed protection service. Right. And your clients are high net worth individuals. And you, uh, you know, if they're going to a public event, if they need to, you know, drive through town, wherever they're going, you kind of, you plan the routes you have employees who are armed, mm-hmm. strapped, right. and you are essentially their secret service, their bodyguards. Right. How great is the danger of Mark Cuban getting kidnapped in affluent, oil-rich Dallas, glittering high-rises? I get if you're in Venezuela. I get if you are a general in Venezuela who has plundered billions from the people right. and you know half the children mal- are malnourished and armed gangs with uzis control half of caracas and you need to get from one end of the city to the other i get why you need like a cavalcade right. how great is the danger in first world america of kidnappings shootings etc um so, well first of all there's three aspects one it's not a super great um percentage however it's super great compared to what you or I are dealing with on a daily basis. Now, part of the gig is not just, hey, we're looking for somebody that's trying to kidnap this guy. A lot of it is brand protection and, you know, having people run up and do things, pranking pranking somebody could yeah. be a disaster. You go up to speak and you have mic cords are laying all over the stairwell in order to get up to the stage. I mean, there are things that run the gambit in order to get somebody to and from. They have to be on time. But moreover, if I or you were interested in taking Mark Cuban's money, you would go after Mark Cuban's family, not Mark Cuban. Right. So that is a lot less obvious because I don't know how many people on the street would recognize his daughter in a jump house and a uh, McDonald's or something. Mm. And so that's essentially where it could happen. And again, uh, most of this is a concierge type of service on the outside right. with all the security and advance work being done ahead of time mm. just to make sure that it's kind of a seamless 
to and fro. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of this, anybody that's got any kind of a high profile has a difficulty going a lot of these places mm -hmm. without some kind of harassment. You yourself, uh, after getting out of the force and writing the book about your experience, which we're going to get into, you received death threats. Yeah. How serious did you take those? We took them very seriously. And uh, ironically, I still have the same phone number as I did then because, I mean, you got to know, right? Uh, but my wife didn't sleep at the house for, I mean, I, if I was out working, then she was somewhere else. Mm. Or if I had a part-time gig or something to spend the night, you know, at a neighborhood. The only part-time jobs I could work as an undercover guy was, you know, working at a neighborhood in my personal vehicle in plain clothes. Right. And then I'd have my wife and my kid in the in the bed of the truck, you know, with the seats folded down <laughs> watching movies because they wouldn't go home. Um, so now, we took them seriously. Of course, you would take them seriously. They're very personal. I mean, we've got death threats on this show. I get DMs with like, keep, you know, keep the Hells Angels names out of your mouth. And right. I, I get offended, but I don't feel scared for my life. But I'm also a cowboy. Right. And, you know, clearly, I mean, we're down in Mexico with cartel members. We don't value our own lives that much, but I get why <laughs> you with a wife and a kid would, but you infiltrated the Crips, a right. black gang, right. fair to say. Yeah. How, how much about that life are they? Do they still have infrastructure? Are they crazy enough to actually kill a cop or kill an undercover cop? They... Are I think now it really this is another interesting point about having been inside and learning more about them as people is that really you know when you look at going after the head of the snake and I'm flipping birds and this and that but I started out buying you know a, buying a yard on the of crack on the street just to help a dude out in order to get an intro to something else that dude poses a bigger danger than anything because what does he have to lose? not nearly as much as this other dude. Mm. And so the threats came from not these guys, because these guys were locked up. They came from family members and people that I had had conversations with and knew in the street. So I actually was privy to who was making these threats, mm. whether by uh, just a deduction and figuring out who it is or whatever, because you know they were just sending texts or calling or whatever. It was you know pre- YouTube channel stuff. Right. And I understand this kind of not of a comparison either. Really, it's not, it wasn't, uh, you know, somebody from, you know, a random state or country. I mean, these were people that I worked inside my own city, rounded up 51 people and put them away. And then their family members mm. that I had dealt with who were still some loose cannons and mm. some were not, but were then launching these threats. And so, yes. And some of those Kingpin guys were absolutely playing the game. It was very structured. Yeah, it was in, it was impressively structured, even more than I thought. Great. All right, let's get into it because we've had a Crip gang member on here before, and we got absolutely no information out of him. So <laughs> that's why I. That's a good Crip, though. That's a good Crip. <laughs> that's right. You don't talk to Whitey. That's so right. I'm glad we have you on because I do want to know about the structure because the Crips, uh, the most famous street gang, probably in the world, wouldn't yeah. you say? Yeah. I mean, Crips and Bloods. I mean, yeah. Their brand, uh, they started off in South Central LA, I believe, as a protection against the Bloods. Am I wrong? Yeah. Or maybe it was the other way around. Yeah. I can't remember if- It was well, Tookie were, Williams and somebody else. Right. And they, you know, they were basically a, a neighborhood organization. Yeah. And the Bloods are much smaller organization oh, okay. in size also. Interesting. Yeah, at least at this point, they certainly are. But now they, and then in the 80s, uh, crack became so flooded in LA that they started exporting all of their sets all over America, including yeah. the Midwest. And through the prison systems also. Okay. And, and that whole crack epidemic is like a whole nother story because again, mm -hmm. it hit uh, socioeconomically impacted hoods yeah. with that drug. Mm -hmm. And so that's why you have gangs running that thing instead of selling more sophisticated dope. Well, yeah. You know, because they're basically they're inside their neighborhoods right. working that stuff. And so that's how it became associated. How do they operate now? And when you were a cop in Dallas, what kind of presence do the Crips have 
in Texas and Dallas specifically? They have plenty of a presence. There was a time where they got a little smarter because in the early 90s, you know, cops would pull them over and just identify them by their tattoos. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, it, it didn't make it hard. And then they started implementing laws against gangs who were practicing gangs. And so when you started getting certain strikes, you were getting arrested for having these identification marks. And so they started trying to call themselves different things here and there. But it returned, you know, by the time I was doing this back in 2005, six, seven, eight, um, they were still Crips. They were still Fortray, mm. Hoover, Deuce. You know, they were they, a lot of the similar names, you know, that had carried over. And they had family here, even, that had done direct kind of training, so to speak. Mm. So uh, they had tears, but I didn't hear as much. So I didn't hear as much about who was a lieutenant, who was a this. Mm. The structure that I saw had a lot to do with if you're at a bottom level, then you're doing a lot more of the dirty work until you start getting a record, which is, I think that's typical. That's how gangs do. They start recruiting sixth graders, you know, because, well, you're a kid. So if you get caught, you know, you're not going to do life. Yeah. Uh, And you're, you're proving yourself in that way. So a lot of that's still happening even today, but it's, it's a little harder to find today because they're a little smarter than just carving four X three across their chest every time. And nobody's outside anymore. Oh, they're outside. And, you know, some of the better, smarter ones are, you know, when when you make it to the top, you're not making it to the top just because you're the most ruthless anymore. You're also by far the smartest. You have the the least criminal history of maybe, so you've always been involved, but, you know, you don't have something, obvious, well, obviously you're out. So yeah. if you can have some tenure and you're out and you're a 30-year-old crip and you've got, you know, bodies on you, then you're going to be the dude if you're smart. Right. If you're stupid, then you're eventually, any day you're going to be going away. Right. And you're driving some kind of car that draws attention. You can pull over mm. every minute. Mm. Well, some of these dudes had real estate licenses, owned multiple car lots <laughs> and storage facilities. And, you know, the way you do it, you know. This What's is, the point of being are, a crip when you're a successful entrepreneur? Well, that makes you wonder, except that, you know, when you're doing 250 grand a week, then you're like, well, you could have done this managing a, well, never mind. You're not going to make that kind of money. Right, right. Okay, so if you're making 250000 a week as a high-level drug dealer, why, how does that cross over with the Crips as a gang organization? It's a culture from the socioeconomically disadvantaged neighborhoods. It really is, it is about being in a poor neighborhood and every, your family member is a Crip, your uncle's a pimp, you're you're living with your mom, but she has two jobs. So you sp- spend half the week with your auntie or your grandma, and all the other kids are making, you know, a thousand dollars every week, doing you know, working as eighth graders, making a thousand bucks a week, you know, moving mm-hmm. stuff. Mm-hmm. And th- your mother, who sees you, you know, three hours a day, is trying to encourage you to stay in school and go get a legitimate job, which is harder for you to do because of who you are and how your transportation is so limited that you can't go to some place across town and every time and be there on time. Yeah. You're an eighth grader. Yeah. Or even if, even if you're a high school kid Mm -hmm. or a, you know, an Mm -hmm. early collegiate aged kid, you know, it's just not as easy. And once you're acclimated and just indoctrinated into that culture after so long, and you don't really have like a father figure, for instance, that's, that has a disciplinary record, Mm -hmm. then you're leaning on your, on your bros that mm-hmm. are that are in the gang. And it's, you know, stupid, but yeah. it's just, it's not as stupid. It's stupid to us because we see how ignorant it can be to why would you do that? But well, gangs you, are not stupid. They're a sociological phenomena and they exist all over the world. Yeah. You know, Hamas started out as a gang. So, and Absolutely. you can hardly blame them when you mm-hmm. see the kind of conditions that they come up in. Mm-hmm. Hey everyone, happy new year. I got to send a shout out to our longtime sponsor of the show, Mood, America's number one online dispensary for Delta 8 and Delta 9 products. If you live in a state where THC products are still illegal, don't worry. Mood has worked with the federal government to ensure the compliance of their Delta 8 and Delta 9 products, which are completely legal, not just statewide, federally legal to order, ship, and use. They have got an array of different edibles, pre-rolls, flour, all types of infused gummies. I cannot recommend them enough. I use their products 
for almost every facet of my life, help with sleep, aches and pains, focus and relaxation, mood has you covered. Right now, they have an amazing offer. If you go over to their website and use the promo code CONNECT20, that's CONNECT20, you will get 20% off anything on that website. Plus, as you know, if you're a longtime listener of the show, use promo code CONNECTFREE, that's C-O-N-N-E-C-T, free, to get a free five-count pack of gummies. All you do is pay for shipping. It's totally free. Go check them out. You guys, I love them. Support them because they support the show. Thank you very much. Let's get back into it. What is the main economic activity now of the Crips? Is it still slinging? Yeah. It's still, still dope slinging. It's still dope. Selling guns and dope, but selling guns is not nearly as profitable as selling dope. Okay. Uh, and it's it, still mostly Coke. I, I know the fentanyl thing is moving in, but yeah. I'm not as familiar with that because I've been out of that game for a while. Right, right. It's fentanyl's a new phenomena. Uh, what about crack? So is it is crack still yeah re- relevant in the yeah. streets? It still is because I mean, you think about taking a bird and essentially turning it into almost two. Mm-hmm. You know, so that when you're when you're putting that out in the street, it's it's blown up. And so there's still market for rock cocaine. Yeah, absolutely. Because when I was growing up in the 90s, I was like, I mean, we had so much, because I went to public school. I went to school with kids whose parents were crackheads, you know, I mm-hmm. went to an inner city school and we got so much scare, scared straight info about crack. Right. I was like, oh, in a generation, this will be gone. Surely nobody will continue to smoke this, but I guess there's a new crackheads. Yeah. Evolving. I mean, again, I think it all so is, it's all connected to opportunity. If you're in a an area with you don't have an uncle that you can lean on to borrow three thousand dollars to start your company or whatever, that those are the situations that you are passing down. You know, you have you grew up in a in a two bedroom apartment with eight kids. Mm. You know that are on social services and and you have an opportunity to start bringing in the money then. Mm that's what you're around all the time. I just, I have a sympathy for that situation. It's not right, but the circumstances are bad. And then as long as racially, you know, it's going to be something that systemically is still an issue, then you're going to stay in a, in a poor hood unless you're just the exception to that rule. Uh, The structure of it, is it such like, say with the American mafia, you've got soldiers who earn in whatever lane that they're good at earning at, whether it's drugs, gambling, sports betting, whatever, that money kicks up to the boss. Mm-hmm. Is Are the Crips that organized or is it like everybody's just freelancing? If I'm a shot caller and I have a kilo of powder, I'm just hitting off the youngsters who it's, are rocking it up. It's more s- simple than that. It's more simple like that because you're talking about the vast majority of the stuff happening is either beefs or moving product in order to have money. And so the dude with the product is the one that has the control. (laughs) And then he creates the people below him that are best to actually put their hands on it. Uh And they only hold it for a second and, you know, give it in quarters to these guys that drive it all the traps, you know, so it's more of a drug operation than anything. Okay. Which is why that's why I leveraged because it's easier for me instead of saying, Hey man, can I jump in? You know, can I be a crib? Yeah. It's easier for me to say, I mean, my source got busted by the feds and I was, you know, he was in Austin and I was moving stuff mm-hmm. from, you know, from there. I've got a bunch of, you know, clients over here at TCU area across town yeah. from where they were. So I'm not a competitor. I'm an opportunity. Yeah. And I just thought, man, how would I start this myself? Like if I yeah. were sociopathic and just thought, I really want to do this. Yeah. Uh, that's where I would start. I okay. Would let's, start let's, let's talk about there. this then. So. <laughs> Given that background, yes, how did you first break the chain? How did you embed with Crips? And yeah, how did you become a cop? For bring us up to that point. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, my my whole goal in becoming a cop was to work undercover just because of my tenure as a musician. I just felt like I could get along with everybody. I was the minority in all the bands I played in. Mm. Um, so I felt like I was really relatable and I thought I would be good at that. Um, so once I finally figured out how to do that, I was making buys from patrol division and writing papers up the chain to see if I could work undercover stuff until I could qualify to go to narcotics and whatever, just trying to earn my way through that. Mm -hmm. 
process, I finally got a, got a deal going. And as I worked, we were finding out that there was an area of town that I actually used to patrol in, which is even more ironic, that, that was, you know, one way in, one way out, lookouts everywhere. Where There's is this? In Fort Worth, on, in East Fort Worth, Southeast Fort Worth. And that's the hood. That, yeah. And that's what we de- deemed the fishbowl. Um, it was, it was a crypt set there that was divided into two where they both had a game happening on both sides. They had different street level guys. It's different mid-level guys. They had different cooks and, but they were still getting it from the same source who was, you know, still within some of the other neighborhoods, still crip related. So everything again, tiered up. Yeah. But that neighborhood, they were, they went to the city council and the chief of police and said, we need to clean this up. How do we, how do we get through this? Because within that, as in any uh, in a drug and gang infested area, there were families and they're just trying to make it. Of course. And again, you're a poor neighborhood. So you've got a, you know, a, 80 year old grandma who's lived there for the majority of her life. And then you say, well, man, this is a terrible neighborhood. You should move. Well, <laughs> you can, you know, that's what people say. Though. Yeah. You know, you should totally move out of here and you should get a job and then all this would be over, you know? So <laughs> sound like my family members at Thanksgiving for the first 20 years of my life. Yeah. 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 So the purpose was to clean that neighborhood up because the people that are trying to make it deserve an opportunity to try to make it. Uh, and so when I first pitched this, it, it just came to mind. They, they were running, you know, jump outs, running warrants and hitting dry holes. You know, there was something was being tipped off. Turns out there was a source inside the PD as well. What does was, that mean? They had a corrupted. They cop? had an, an, in, an informant at the very least. It was, yeah, wasn't wow. take, wasn't on the take as much, but grew up in the neighborhood yeah. and was feeding them information. If they knew there were papers going to be served. Then just like it would get served, they'd kick in a door and there'd be nothing in there. It's amazing how often that happens. <laughs> right, right. Uh, so, you know, pulling over people leaving and stuff like that. But again, it's not just a drug operation. It's a it's the Crip organization that's running it. Mm-hmm. So it was iron fisted. And even some of the lieutenants were getting smashed. And yeah, people drive down there and here there was dope and they beat their ass and leave them on the side of the street. Mm. Because it's not you're not just welcome to come in there and you know turn it into a Seven Eleven because they had their they had their system down. Um, so so you I, couldn't open up like a crack house and start serving. Oh, no, no, in no, the no. fishbowl. Oh no, no no no. So were there drive by shootings like you know classic yes. L A drive by shootings? Does uh, that kind of thing happen in Dallas or in yeah. Fort Worth? Oh yeah, I mean mm-hmm. it was happening while this was going on. We had we lost a dude that was out there that got shot in his front yard. And again, it's just over stupid beefs. Again, it's gang beefs. That in my opinion, if you were really running a tight knit operation, you'd be like, man, you're drawing way too much attention to what we're doing here. Mm-hmm. But it's not it's not just about drugs and drug money. It's about gang banging. That seems like the money. majority of the gang banging now is not re- over any real money. Well, this was real money, but the gang banging, I, in my perception, seemed like a separate thing. I mean, we're gang banging, but we're going to make our nut by moving cocaine. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's just what they were doing, but they, they didn't aspire to be, they wanted to be a big timer, but they wanted to still be the big gang guy. They don't mm-hmm. want to just be a, just a dope dealer. So that's still the psychology of a lot of these guys. It's not just to be a successful drug dealer. It's to be a hard rock. Like yeah. it's to be, you yeah. know, and they'll still use, they'll still use the ploy of, you know, we're protecting the neighborhood from a lot of stuff, you know, how much bad <laughs> stuff's around here, you know, yeah. that's the, and every gang does that too. Uh, Hamas mm-hmm. to the to the Italian mob to everybody they'll mm-hmm. leverage that kind of a, a justification you know for mm-hmm. it so I had decided after I'd been doing this kind of work I pitched to an informant then we went and set a sat down over whiskey and I said all right here's my idea we're doing we're, they've been doing all these things trying to you know, break into the fishbowl and I know we know who a bunch of the players are so my plan is I'm going to go in start making buys I'm going to tell them you know that my my guy got busted by the feds. And so I don't have a connect. I'm trying to, you know, kind of link in to kind of start over, but I have the money. And blah, blah, blah. Uh, you're trying and so, to buy powder. Yeah. Okay. Uh, ultimately it's what I want to do because if you go, but you can't just start buying powder, you know, this, you mm-hmm. don't just pull up as a newbie and say, Hey man, where can I find two powder? ounces? Right. Yeah. Especially there. So when he finished laughing his ass off, I, I said, no, dude, like for real, this is, yeah. we're going to be able to make this happen. Why I was, was he laughing? Because you're white? Yeah. I mean, look at this, you know, so. Yeah, it, but white, but ha, let me ask about that. You know, the majority of people who use hard drugs are white. 
that's statistically, I mean, <clears throat> the most, the biggest population, well, yeah, right. the most money. Populous so one. how does that work? Like in a place like Dallas with Crips, can crackheads, white crackheads from the suburbs or heroin addicts, whatever it is, can they come get served yes. in places like the fishbowl? Yeah. I mean, if you're, yeah. If like you're they don't missing, discriminate. Yeah. Well, if you're missing a shoe and you've been, you know, meeting up with the the hookers that literally at the end of the street that border the fishbowl, they know who you are too. Obviously. So, yeah. Then so if you need a corner good. dude, they're going to take care of that or whatever. But for the most part, and it's almost part of the pathetic painting of how this works, is mm. they sell amongst each other more than really getting outside of the hood and moving that stuff outside. Mm. Uh, now, once you get to a certain weight, you kind of don't know where it goes. Right. But um, but a lot of this, you know, was tight knit. And so the vast majority, I mean, with few exceptions, were were black guys right. that were coming in there. So, And was your first informant who you sat down with and pitched this to, was he a black guy from the neighborhood? He was, uh, I have a black guy and a white guy that I worked with. And the white guy was a crackhead mm -hmm. and the black guy wasn't a crackhead but was a was the perfect middleman because he just was always trying to be a somebody mm -hmm. uh so and what i leveraged them for is when i went down the first time i would act like i'm the money guy since this guy's obviously a user he wants to get a, a little score a little something but he's trying to get a start a little hustle yeah. So he's telling me where to go and I'm going down there. And as people come up, start asking all these questions, I'm like, ah, no, 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 I don't, I'm not touching none of that stuff. This is, this is from my boy, but you talk to him. So they go over and talk to him and he would tell him what he wanted. And then when he'd tell him what he wanted, I'd slip him a C note and then he would, you know, pay for it and take care of it. I was acting like the hands off guy. Okay. You know, okay. In the beginning. So, so I was, I was acting like his money guy. Like I'm hooking my bro up up here. He's trying to get out and do his hustle thing. So is that pretty wild? Like when you first go in there, you're in this like cordoned off neighborhood. Absolutely. Are you scared? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it, do you have backup? Do you have people that can, if you start getting in a gunfight, you know, or down the road? This is how it works. Um, this is how it worked for me. This is not how it actually works. Um, I had a, a leadership level supervisor that kind of let me do my thing and understood that I was going to do something smart with myself. Um, and cause normally if you set something up like that, you've got a bunch of, you know, you got six white dudes and Ford Explorers and baseball caps and whatever. It never Too obvious. Could, never going to work yeah. you, cause you to be close enough. So what I would do is I would call on a cell phone line. I would call one of the guys I used to be in patrol with in that area and tell them, Hey, I'm about to do this or that. And if I say, you know, if I say, uh, you know, man, that's the, then drive through the front door and come get me. Yes. Yeah. So I figured that would be easier anyway, mm -hmm. because, uh, they, they can run lights and sirens and disrupt anything that's about to go yeah. down. Um, but you're, but, you're but strapped though, completely right? Completely off the books. Yeah. I was strapped. Mm. Um, as were all them. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had no advantage. You're sitting in a car with a piece then. I mean, say goodbye. Yeah. I mean, you, you might die with it halfway pulled out of your yeah, drawers. Shoot your off or something. <laughs> yes. Yeah. If you don't do that, mm -hmm. that was the suicide method, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, that's the, that's the Hari Kari of yeah. uh, Dallas. Same, same type of person that would take uh, antifreeze to, to kill themselves with. Um, so yes, yeah, I w it's scary in that it was ominous and a rush. I feel like, and I've heard you talk about like what a rush it is just to be in that game and I had an interesting perspective on that because I felt like, man, I'm rolling the windows down. I got my music blaring. I'm doing my thing. Uh, so I felt a little bit of that vibe happening. Only I didn't have any of the upside. I only had the downside, you know? <laughs> yeah. So Because I'm not making, making yeah. jack on this. You You're know making I mean? a city salary. <laughs> I'm, and I'm, it's out of principle. I mean, it really is. I really just thought, man, this, th this is a... a um, a noble thing to do because this neighborhood really needs cleaning up. And, you know, I'm a hippie, I'm a hippie musician guy. Do so you I'm, think honestly that street rips and cleaning up <clears throat> drug dealers from a neighborhood long-term helps the neighborhood or? No, but that's not what I was doing. I wasn't cleaning up drugs. I was cleaning up gangs. Don't you think they just come back though? They can come back. It depends. See, because in this in this case, half these houses they used were dilapidated and you know yeah. boarded up or needed to be condemned or whatever, and they owned half the properties in there. 
Oh. So, so once, they bought the yeah, houses. Yeah, once it was eradicated, then they had, you know, people coming in, fixing up fences and planting gardens yeah. and putting layers of paint. Mm-hmm. And then they rent them out to somebody who can afford a nice place that wants a nice place for their kids. And then you replace them with them while they're in prison. Uh-huh. Obviously, the cycle is the main thing that really got me motivated to write this book. Too, okay. Because the cycle is the key. Because now, if you mentor the kids that are left, we had 104 kids left after we did a roundup. So you're basically just counting down the years and trying to recruit the next undercover that can start knocking them down, yeah. which is only, this is a cog in the solution. This isn't the solution. No. So they need to be arrested, yes. And we need the opportunity to clean up the neighborhood, yes. And salvage the people that are trying to make it so they can get out of poverty, Yes. But then you have to mentor these kids that come out of there so that they don't end up being who their fathers were. That right, because you've just up. removed, yes, you've gotten rid of gang members and drug dealers, but you've just removed all the men <clears throat> from the neighborhood. Yeah, right. And and in a lot of cases, um, you know, I'll say it's the fathers is a, a general term. And we've got guys in there that name their kids who've adduced. So it, it was... Um, it was good and bad. Like I said, it's it's an ugly situation. And a lot of these guys I really got to know over time. And I really liked them. And I was rooting for them wow. to, to flip or whatever and get mm. time. I testified on behalf of, was it four or five? Four or five of them. I actually testified on behalf of their character so that they would get less time. Get leniency. The guys that I liked. Uh-huh. <clears throat> that okay, I felt like so I had a lot of promise, you know. But let's, that doesn't, uh, this is, you know, I'm, I'm digressing. I don't no, know it's okay. It's okay. I just want to, I want to move through this, but it's good that we know the motivation, you know? And I think when I talk to a lot of cops, <clears throat> that's the story I get is they come in sometimes idealistic, but it's, they, I think a lot of cops do feel like, especially in undercover work, like they are helping the neighborhood. Like they're there for a purpose. Yeah. So, uh, so this is how you're betting yourself. So you're the money guy. You start off just buying like what? Like what does a hundred bucks get you? It's a you know a gram, like a, you know gram. Is a gram of coke a hundred bucks in Dallas? It was. I mean, it could have been. <laughs> what I year mean, is this? In uh, two thousand five, yeah. six, seven, eight. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So, and is this good coke? Do Crips? Do <clears throat> black street gangs generally? Is there re up Mexican cartels? Yeah. Yes. The, okay. So yeah, my kingpin was getting it direct. So yeah, uh, and they know how to make it. They know how to make it good, and they know how to make it bad. And this was literally that neighborhood with that six square block area had really crappy dope and and straight drop, where you could buy basically within that same neighborhood. Man, you got all the gangster slang. Straight <laughs> drop, bro. You're a G dog. Well, I've had some people just laugh at me. Any of the terms I know, they're like laughing, thinking, well, I was in third grade and that used to be, I don't know. <laughs> like I said, I'm not actively in this, this kind of thing. So, 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 but the, but the shot callers know how they really know how to handle Coke. Yeah. So they either have, uh, they have good that they charge more for, or they have Bammer that they've diluted and that's probably, and that's cheaper and that's right. crack. Right. What's a $3. Can you get like a $5 hit, a $3 hit? I didn't even mess with that. I'm okay. sure, yes, but I I didn't okay. go that low because again, I didn't want to be so obvious. Yeah, I mean, me even spending a hundred dollars for crack as a guy set up the way I was. Yeah, driving around in a Benz and a you know a TCU shirt or whatever, or even purposely a Steve Young jersey, which is bright red. Uh, why? Wait, why? Because if I'm ignorant to the gang aspect and I'm moving weight. And I'm used just trying to get my game back on. Then I can leverage the intelligence that I get from them telling me not to wear it. And this is why you don't wear it and whatever. And that's all. Oh, because then you look ignorant. You're like, oh, I didn't know you guys are. Yeah, uh, you guys banging on the other side. Yeah, Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I didn't act like I'm a complete idiot. I've never heard of Crips or whatever. But that wasn't my purpose there. So when that gets explained to me, I know I'm in the right place. And it gives me an open door to start asking questions about, man, well, well, who's the guy? Is like, is is this okay that I'm dealing with you? Whatever. And they'll explain. Okay. So how did you, Hey, yeah. How'd you move up the ladder? (laughs) I I like. So uh, the, what I started doing is I would start coming down there by myself and asking for people that I knew weren't gone. So that was the next step. So then I would start making treks in, but I was looking for someone. I wasn't spending money at first. 
So what I would do, I'm working on a limited budget. So I would take a hundred ones and, you know, 10 twenties and wrap it up in a wad. And, you know, the rip is the main concern that I have, but I also got to look like I'm carrying money. Right. And so I go up and I say, I'm, I'm looking for this cat. And they said, well, he's not here. And I said, well, when is he going to come back? And they're like, I don't know what you're looking for. You know, they're trying to hit me up. And I said, well, man, I, you know, I'm not looking for nothing hard or whatever. I got a bunch of folks on the West side. So, um, you know, I'm looking for that soft. He said, man, come on, you know, they start talking to me and I'll say, look, maybe I can get something to move. So, you know, give me a yard. I'll see what I can do. You know, just for, if you, if you will tell him that I was here to see him, man, just let, let me know. So next time I could link, you know, whatever. And these are street level guys and I'm leveraging them more for, the information to get me the introductions to the next level dudes. Okay. So you're just doing this on purpose to be able to buy for more street level people, identify people. Right. Uh, and ultimately like get them to flip. Ultimately either flip or move me. I, yeah. I need, I need you to introduce me to the guy yeah. I just asked you about. Right. And I know you don't get it direct, but I know you get it from him who gets it direct. Yeah. So if, even if you link me here, my whole goal was to make sure though, that I was dealing with Crips the whole time. Cause yeah. before you know it, you can take a left turn and you're just dealing with drug dealers. And then I have a different case altogether. What, what is the advantage of why Crips specifically? Is that because you can get a gang enhancement? Or, uh, or? Well, you can. Um, yeah. Because it's essentially a gang, yeah, a gang case, and and we sold not, solved nine cold case murders out of those things. People start opening their mouths about stuff like, you know, Pookie's got two keys in his living room. I'm like, I don't care about keys no more. I said, well, he shot that dude over at the stop and shop. So, oh, well, I think I got somebody that wants to talk to you. Oh, <laughs> you know wow. what I mean? Yeah, yeah. You know, so uh, again, it's just close knit. You're talking to a bunch of people that are either affiliated or know somebody directly. So. Um, I would either do that or just say, hey, man, if you need to move something, I'd be happy. The last last time the stuff was kind of bunk. So, man, clean it up if you can get. And then they start explaining who's got what supply yeah. and all that kind of stuff. And wow. So they really open themselves up to you. Well, eventually. So the when people start giving me the 20 questions, obviously, you know, I pull up, I'm still getting a million questions. And, you know, are you the police? I said, man, I was about to ask you, you're the police. What, you, you know, you don't look like you're wearing the same, you know, gear. What's going on with that? Um and they, and I also don't answer those questions. I think most cops, especially if they're new, will, well, here's my driver license. This is my name. And, you know, I, I swear I'm, a, I'm not a cop and I, you know, I just want to buy this much, whatever. I would say no right away. If they're like, man, where are you from? You, you know, what's your real name? That's your real name is like, Hey man, I don't answer these questions. If you want to do business, cool. If you don't want to do business, cool. I'll find somebody else who wants to do business. Mm. And if they told me to go pound sand, I would go down the block and meet up with somebody else and they'd make some money and I'd drive off. And then I'd come back and meet with the dude I was looking for. And then they'd start being like, Hey man, and they're flagging me down. The next time I come in, like, Hey, you know, T what's going on? Mm -hmm. You know, I go by T and they'd flag me down and, before you know it, I get some of those dudes that would ro roll me around and, you know, say, you yeah. know, this, these are some dudes that you, we might be able to get you in. They would try to get me intros. So I was leveraging informants uh, at the beginning just to have a, 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 a um, what's the word I'm looking for? A plausible mm -hmm. uh, reason for reason. being there. Yeah. You know? so, so, so you start off buying a yard, which is like a hundred bucks, yeah. uh, something like that. Uh, and then what do you, you step up to like ounces? <clears throat> you're supposed to be a white, you're supposed to be like a, a yeah. middle-class quarter keys just went from there to quarter keys at that point. All the way to nine ounces. Yeah. Okay. Because That's a again, lot of Coke. But part, but here's the, the beautiful thing that happened. It is a lot, but if your connects are all swearing by me now, there's no informants here. These are all your own people are introducing me to you. Say, man, T's good. We haven't, man, I do this, this, this. And he knows that he knows who's, who's is what. And I'm getting introduced, introduced by those same people. These guys don't deal in small amounts anyway. Mm. So if I'm, the higher I get, the more difficult it's going to be to make buys before I have to get bigger money. Cause I'm working on a, a city narc budget. Which is I'm, how much? Dude, I was, I was spending a thousand bucks a week, which Again, all I'm doing is buying samples, essentially, mm -hmm. and making promises that, man, this is gonna, we're going to make this work. Let's sample this out. But I'm thinking, how am I going to get this freaking money? I mean, these right. eventually you got to, you know, get did, off the pot. Did you get gonna... pushback from your superiors who were like, dude, we can't just keep well, giving yeah, you a thousand? Because they didn't money. have. I mean, they literally didn't have it. So we went Fed shopping. 
That's what we did. And, you know, I took my case to the DEA first, thinking that would be cool. And they were like, hey, this this looks like this would be a cool case. Give us the names and everything else, and we'll take it from here. Thanks. And I was like, no. Yeah, this is my sh-. Yeah. So uh, the FBI was the perfect fit. They had a gang task force person that was assigned to the city gang unit. And so they transferred me there and assigned me to the FBI. So I essentially was put on, under the supervision of a single FBI agent mm. who was busy working on another case in the beginning, um, which was not her fault. She was just busy. And I got assigned under her. She was the only one assigned to that gang task force. So what I got was Range Rovers with cameras. And if I needed to you know, buy a key, then I would just ask for $16,000 and we'd do it. And because they essentially they have so much confiscated the money, resor- the resources are there when you're yeah. dealing with feds. And I had a case that was actively working. It's not like, right. hey, I want to try to butt break in with these guys. I mean, yeah. I was already rolling, mm-hmm. but my problem was I was only going to get this far before someone starts calling bullshit on me anyway. Right. You know, because eventually you got to pony up the money and start moving something because everybody's seen me buying samples and dealing with different people, but they're going to figure out that I never really spend any good money. Right. So, uh, I and did. Then, does that become because now you're using the feds' money and resources? Does it now become a fed case? Yes, even though you're a local. Yes, okay. So, you assigned me to the feds. Oh, so, interesting. Yeah. So, so a lot of these fed cases for street level gang stuff are actually carried out by <clears throat> local or city cops. A ton of them are. That's interesting. A ton okay. of them are. There's right. not a ton of feds now. Feds do all that work, but not in bulk and there's not that many mm-hmm. across the US mm-hmm. but if you link with these big metropolitan cities that can create cases that you can adopt yes then great that makes sense and okay. they they had, didn't adopt i know in your case they tried to adopt your case but this was a ongoing case so right. their whole thing was we have one person in charge of this thing yeah and so you're going to be the undercover we just we'll give you resources now i still didn't have all the resources i needed right um so you're so, essentially a a one man federal operation. It's man, it's no sleep either. Man. <laughs> That's crazy, bro. It, yeah. And then, okay, let me ask you this before we get into like the bigger buys. Are you like, I just imagine, I'm picturing McNulty from The Wire. Okay. Like, uh, you've seen The Wire? Yeah. Okay. I watched, I didn't get to see all of it because, again, I was doing this work during The Wire. Yeah, right. I, like You're I got living four the hours and this is just, wearing me out yeah. to watch this happen again. So love it, it. Is, is, are you writing, are you dictating? Like if you go make a buy and get contact with, you know, a couple of dealers and gang members, are you going back and writing it all out? Yeah. So here's, here's the other little secret that I used. So when I would take notes, I would, I had snot rag galore in my car. So I would just take a, like a nasty napkin or something, write down a license plate. Mm. This guy was pooky. He was about this tall. He had a tat of a something on his forearm, you know, just sold him or whatever, so that I could go back later and investigate who the guy was. Now, just because I'm paranoid, I would write a report and it would say, you know, purchase of whatever, mm-hmm. assign a report number, send it to the lab, and then say, see supplement and not write a supplement yet. Because what I worried about is, you know, you go in our NARC office and there's filing cabinets full of stuff. So Mm -hmm. if somebody wanted to see everything I was doing, they could go in and start pulling files just if they're curious even. Not that I thought anyone working with me would. I was just really paranoid about- Leaks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even just just not crooked cops, but just bad cops. Right. Just ones that aren't you know, paying attention. There's plenty of those. Plenty, <laughs> right? So I was in so far already that I just could not afford that kind of, I especially see. if they screwed up something and I didn't know. So essentially b- between me and my boss who was protecting me from everybody else, mm-hmm. I would keep my own notes on mm-hmm. the side that were, were written, but I would leverage them with some of those notes mm-hmm. that I would take out in the field. Right. Because as a cop, I feel when you're putting a case this big together, you really have to have the documentation together or else a good lawyer can for sure in court say, Hey, he, he didn't follow the rules Yep, and you know, people could get off. Of, so absolutely. You really like that seems like the worst part about being a cop is the paperwork. Uh, yeah. Well, when I went to the feds, it got worse. <laughs> You're right. I it, imagine. it was four times worse on the paperwork, right? The, right. The yeah. IOC for your bathroom break. Right. Right. But, so, okay. So you've got fed money now. Um, and you're, you're picking up who sold you a, a quarter chicken who, who sold you, you know, a, a nine. So one of the first dudes that came out 
on my first ride through, stepped outside the house. And I knew who he was, but obviously wasn't trying to talk to him because I wasn't supposed to know nothing. Mm. Um, and he had stepped out. He was one of the guys that ran one half of the block. And he was just stepping out to kind of watch this thing go down and see, see whatever happened. Um, he had a sidekick who was a dude that had just gotten out of state prison on parole for an ag robbery. And they'd been out through all kinds of crap, you know, with their gang stuff, they shootings in their house and all kinds of stuff that are going on on a regular basis. And these guys were just into all kinds of a mess, but mm. they were, I would say, intermediate level guys. Mm. Like, you know, they were two steps above, you know, any of these people I'm dealing with. Right. Um, so they knew who I was. And those were the guys where I started eventually starting to meet. And my first meeting with him was almost a disaster too, because I brought my, my informant had a dude that was from South Texas, who was a Hispanic guy who had been dealing with some of the big wigs and, uh, the Los Setas at the time, mm. who was a connection there. And, and he brought his own pistol to the, to the game. I, I went to go pick up my guy to go do this thing. And he brings Carlos with him and he's like, and I don't trust Carlos. I don't know Carlos. And I'm doing my usual thing. Like I'm calling one of my partners in patrol on the horn. He's going to be a half a mile away mm. listening over a phone. And I got one dude that I don't even know, but I've already heard all the stories. Uh, and so that was the first time that we went to actually his house. It was like a big breakthrough for me because as you know, these cats don't lay their heads where they make all the, mm -hmm. all the mess. And when you get invited to their house house, you're like, man, this is, I'm making some headway. Right. So I was going to meet him and talk about you know, making this first quarter. And the it's dark. You know, the streetlights, half of them don't work. And you're walking up to a burglar bar door. And I got these two jackasses with me. One of them's a Hispanic guy that I don't even know. And I'm, I'm thinking, I'm trying to make this work, but informants are a real pain in the ass. Mm -hmm. So I'm just trying to make the best hay that I could. And this jacked up dude that I don't know, op swings the door open and points a shotgun at us through the burglar bar door and starts screaming at us, what are you mother doing here? And blah, 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 you mm. know, belong here. Because again, we're knocking on his boy's door and- he doesn't know who we are. Mm -hmm. And his boy barely knows me anyway. So um, I just start trying to calm everybody down and just thinking about where I'm going to move. If I have to shoot this, I'm going to get off the stairs. Because mm. you're staring on these, it's a three-step thing with no guardrail up to a burglar bar door. So, and you're standing on What's these What's a burglar stairs. bar door? Like a barricaded... Uh, just like a door. wrought iron door that's, yeah. you know, that's stuck to the outside of the door frame and then locked with another deadbolt. And do these neighborhoods, do these houses look like something you'd see in Detroit? Yeah, they're like, similar. They're the old, the old uh, clapboard, forties and fifties built. Yeah, yeah. A lot of abandoned, like lots around. Yeah, you know, grass growing. Yeah, like, the house, one house half burns down, and then leave yeah. it. Right. You know, okay. I mean, gotcha. Yeah. This is like Southern poverty. You don't yeah. see that a lot. No. Where we're from. Yeah, and it's and it's you know concentrated. Too. Yeah. Yeah. So, and this house was functional. Obviously, the burglar bar doors is a very common thing. Some some dudes would build like a cage, you know, that cover the mm -hmm. patch, the patio. And mm -hmm. then when they got really smart, they'd put one of those inside. Wow. So you try to run a warrant on that. Pry the first door <laughs> open, smash the second door, and walk into a cage. And now you're trapped in yes. the cage. Oh my gosh. Yeah. But this wasn't that case. Okay. Um, so I'm trying to talk everybody down against one of those deals where how am I going to explain this? Or we're going to have to shoot somebody and I'm here and nobody knows I'm here. Um, so it's all this yapping. And finally, my guy runs to the door, calms him down. So what the hell are you doing? And, you know, screaming at him, you know, T, it's cool. Don't worry about it. You know, he unlocks the door and we kind of walk in. He goes, man, who's the, I don't remember what he called him, he called him something derogatory. Um, but Carlos then pulls his pistol from his mouth and runs over to the shotgun dude and pins him against the wall uh, by his neck and shoves the gun in his mouth. Oh. He drops the shotgun that he was carrying. And now it's worse because it was just a scene where I was freaking out. I'm thinking I'm finally making some progress mm. and there's going to be a shooting that's going to end this whole thing. Yeah, if not to shoot somebody. Everybody. Yeah. yeah, if not that, then it's for sure going to be the end of this case. Yeah. That only one dude kind of knows is happening and I mean, it's going to be a train wreck. Now, what kind of obligation when you're working undercover and there's one guy who shoves a gun in another guy's mouth as an officer, like you're supposed to defend first and foremost. 
uh, oh, what, I'm, I'm what kind of obligation defend. do you have to like say case is done? I got to you save this guy's life. Um, that's do a, they train you on that? Do they tell you that? <laughs> Not so specifically that, but yes, your uh, your general obligation is that. However, long term, uh, if you think of the goal that you have, why did we start doing this in the first place? Both of these fools need to be racked up and put behind bars, really. So for me to end this now, knowing how much more I have to go, because I'm just now getting my first intro to an intermediate level dude. And the, I've, so I've got all these low level dudes and then this guy possibly on the hook. I'm not, that wasn't even a consideration. I can tell you that. Mm. Um, now, stopping this from turning into a shooting absolutely was a consideration because again, it ends everything. So I've stepped on the shotgun. This guy's screaming in Spanish and the guy I was with spoke Spanish and they're yelling at each other in Spanish. My guy's trying to talk him down. My, the other foreman I brought with me yeah. is trying to speak Spanish to him to talk sense into him. Because I'm just trying to tell people, calm down, calm down. It's cool. It's cool. And I'm looking at my guys I'm like, dude, this is cool. So the guy eventually pulls the gun out and curses and walks back out to tell him to wait at the freaking car. Like, step outside, dude. You're a freaking mess. Some gangster. And this, so this guy just walks to the sink and starts spitting teeth and, Ooh. you know, in the sink. Because well, you break your teeth. Yeah. Have you ever broken a tooth? And I got one right here that the sensitivity is pretty yeah. bad. But I mean, obviously he was bleeding because he got his gun. I mean, he got his gums chopped up. But um, at that point, it literally was, man, I need to I need to get this fool away. I apologize for bringing this to your house. And even at that point, I was worried that we weren't going to have a deal. But there was no point then to say, hey, man, you want to negotiate something? Because at that point, I mean, I got this dude standing outside of his house that's a mm -hmm. complete train wreck. He's got a guy that's got to render aid to. I said, man, let me hit you up again. He goes, man, don't worry about it. I'll hit you up. And I think it gave me some street cred instead of destroying my opportunity. It built an opportunity. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, and so then I was able to actually reach out with a phone call, show up, have a conversation alone and felt better about being alone because then it was, he was relieved too yeah. that I didn't bring anybody. Right. Yeah. Uh, and then just did your typical thing. You know, they name the spot. I make sure the spot's clear. If we move once or twice, fine. I don't think we even moved around that much. Yeah. And I brought somebody again. I tried to do it the first time I did that. I s assimilated to the first way I did it, mm -hmm. which was I pull up, he jumps in the car and, and he sh starts to hand me the stuff. I said, like, no, 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 no. I don't want the stuff. I don't want the stuff. I just want to know that you have it and gave him the money. I said, go, go back there and give it to him. And he got out of my car, goes back into the other car. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm making it sound like we can't trace this transaction. Like it's not a legitimate transaction. Yeah. That's obviously a legitimate transaction. Right. If you have an informant back there accepting the dope on mm -hmm. your behalf, mm -hmm. same with, you know, the small stuff with the car. I'm like, Hey, yeah. I don't want to touch it. I'm just going to sit here and watch you do it, hand him the money and yeah. pretend like that you can't make a case on that, right. which you can. Yeah. Uh, but that was the same kind of hands off way. Because again, if I'm bigger than they are, just coming from that kind of a mm -hmm. of elk, then obviously I'm going to be more careful. Right. You know, and I'm not just going everywhere they want to go and just making this super easy. I right. want to have some control too. And that's the way I leverage control. Do you pick the spot? Then if you're going to make the delivery, deliver it to him, I'll give you the cash and you. Right. You know. So that ha after buying nine ounces, how long until you get up to bricks? And did you, <clears throat> were, was your goal to meet that guy's guy? Yes. And were you successful in doing it? Yes, and not long, but here's how it worked. Because the FBI was not terribly excited about spending tons of money on this. Um, they had the money. I mean, mm -hmm. in comparison, it wasn't even funny. Mm -hmm. But th this guy's sidekick, I told you, that was kind of their enforcer dude that had just gotten out on the ag robbery. Um, he and I rode around one day, and we, we were just, I can't remember why we were riding. We were just riding around. You know, sometimes they'd hop in. The, I have a Benz, you know, so they hop in the Benz. We go cruising around sometimes. And he started asking me if I'm carrying. I said, yeah, man, I'm carrying. And, you know, this is what I use. It's a little, you know, hidden hammer, you know, 38 something, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. And I didn't mind showing it to him because if I'm showing it to him, now it's in my hand. And I'm ready anyway, <laughs> yeah, you know. Right. And I'm not pretending. Again, yeah, I'm strapped. You know, I don't I do not do all the movie stuff either. You know, you're not going to pat me down and make me do a bump and what I, well, I don't play none of that. Yeah. So you don't have a vest on though, do you? No, 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 no. Right. I'm just, you can't. No. Nah. Too obvious. No. Um, so at that point, he pulls out this Clint Eastwood 45 that he's got. This dude's like 5'8. <laughs> oh.
Buzzo reached his knee. He's like, so check this puppy out. And it was awesome. Uh, it's like a Magnum? Yes. 357 Magnum? freaking wheel gun, man. Holy. It was. Um, so I was like, man, that's, that's pretty good. And after we talked, he's like, man, I just want you to know, man, if you get any flack from these fools out here, I know some people talk stuff, but you're good with us, man. And if you need, ever need anything, you let me know. I'll take care of you. So I had essentially an enforcer who was saying, wow. man, T, I kind of got your back if yeah. you run into any problems out here. And so that is essentially what took me from this level to the next level. Because <laughs> what happened was there was a dude that is a dork and a half uh, on the east side that came into a bunch of money. And when he came into a bunch of money, he wanted to start flipping it. It's the same thing that happened when we Paid a big informant one time. It's 50 grand. It lasted him a month. He bought a car and a couple of keys. Hold on. A dude on the east side of Dallas, Fort Worth. Fort Worth. They, he, a white boy? No, actually, it was a black guy. But but he, I don't understand. So he, you got word so, that he was trying to start moving product? Right. He's trying to move product. And he's, nobody's interested in dealing with him because he just came into this money. And even though he's from the neighborhood and been around the neighborhood, nobody's interested in saying, "Hey, let's get a let's get a kilo for this guy." Yeah, yeah. No, nobody's interested. In How that. did you find out about this guy? I just knew him from moving in and out of the neighborhood. So okay. eventually, eventually, I could literally roll. And this is the smaller part of the neighborhood, the fishbowl. Yeah. But then you graduate out into the other side that is still part of Crip territory. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, by that time I'd been doing so many deals. I was walking into kitchens when they're cooking and whatever. And people were flagging me down and saying, what's up? Or riding around, getting my car washed at the car wash, asking me if they can get introduced to TCU cheerleaders. And, you know, it was just, my whole thing was if I'm going down there every day of the week, practically, it can't be to buy dope every time. No. So half the time I would go down again and ask, hey man, where's, where's Joe at? Whatever. And they would say, any in here? And I said, like, oh, well, pff, and I'd pull out a, you know, a right. four pack, you know, we'd sit and split a beer or run up to the car wash and we'd just chat. So your yeah. idea is like, you, you want to be seen as someone who's not just there buying drugs all the time, but just kind of wants to have his thumb on the pulse of, you know, he wants to make better connections. Right. Well, I do, but I don't want them to think that. So, so I'm what's, literally coming what's down. What's the point I'm, of being down there if you're not buying? Well, because I'm asking for somebody that I know is not there. I see. So then it's just conversational. Wait, yeah. What you up to? You know, then I know people. So then right. the other part of town too, I would drive around and people would hit me up. Hey T, you know, whatever. And if I really don't know who these people are, or and and I and in my mind, if if I don't know they're a crip, then I'm not interested in just doing a deal anyway. Mm -hmm. So I did get to a point where once we started buying a little bit more, it's harder for a street level kid to come up and say, "Man, let's do whatever." And for me to do that almost looked bad. Yeah, because yeah. I was starting to come up and was kind of the guy. Nobody knew how much stuff I was really moving. Yeah, which was nothing, obviously moving. Right. What were you spending with them? Every week or every two weeks. This is how it happened. So this kid with all the money that's not getting any traction yeah. is asking me, man, how do you do this? Because he knows I'm the other square You're in right. this equation. Yeah. And I said, man, I'll tell you what. I have a I have a connect and I know you're from this side of the neighborhood. Again, fishbowl's here. The mm -hmm. other part of the neighborhood's over here. I've just been breaking in, but I'm looking for my guy who lives over here, my kingpin is over here. A lot of the bigger runners that are moving weight to other distributors yeah. are over here. So I'm trying to figure out introductions over here. Yeah, This guy knows these people, but he's not working with them, but he mm -hmm. knows them well because he's been around them for so long. Yeah. Then I tell him, man, I tell you what, do me a favor. If you, if you're looking to get whatever it is, he was wanting to, he was wanting to get a bird to flip with his with first number of money that he, whatever yeah. he had. I said, I'll tell you what, I can tell you where to get it. When you call, I'll call, uh, I'll call ahead and then I'll have you call so that you're coming to pick up for tea. Cause I know you tell OG over here that you're picking up for me and you spend your money, whatever it is, but I'm trying to get bigger too. So since you know, so-and-so, if you'll just help me get an introduction to this guy. I'm trying to do some bigger things, man. Mm. And then maybe we can work together at some point, but I can actually protect you and get you what you need if you go buy for me. 
So he literally was, he was going to buy dope anyway. Mm -hmm. So he goes and buys dope, but now it looks like I'm sending him to get my dope. Mm. So when he's buying birds, I'm not actually able to document that. Right. um, And put it in the lab and write a report because he's going to go move it somewhere. But you've ingratiated yourself, not only with him, but with whoever's selling him the bird because you're giving him business. Right. Yeah. So at that point, no matter how much he buys, it's T's business. Right. So now he's out in those same hoods doing his thing with a load of money that he came into and moving it wherever it is that Mm -hmm. he's moving it. And I'm getting all the credit. Yeah. And that's really what helped me get there because I okay. wasn't a, I didn't have a budget where they were willing to go spend hundreds of thousands of dollars mm-hmm. for me to buy all that kind of stuff yeah. and buy my way up because it was, again, they were just like, this is a gang case, man. We're not going to spend $200,000 right. on cocaine. It's not a cartel order. case. Right. Yeah. So that made it much easier for me when he was actually out doing a lot of that footwork. And I kept, my reputation kept growing. You know, people knew who I was and it, you know, turned out to be a, a really great advantage for me. Okay. So what's the next, what's the next big level? What's the next like boss that you met at the kilo level? Well, I'd met, I'd met several by then and was turning them on to him. Mm -hmm. Really the trying to think the easy, the timeline is, was really crazy too, because I was, I remember, so this was right about the same time that I had my guy um, buying for me. Mm. I was um, rolling down the street and this guy pulls up and I happened to be rolling with an informant that was with me that day. I pick him up this corner store every day and we just kind of roll around and we just trade information, see what he's got, whatever. And this dude pulls up in this Lexus and he's like, hey man, I've been hearing about you, this and that, man, you know, I got some stuff, man, you're going to love it and everything else. And I'm, I look over at my guy and he's like, yeah, I man, it'd probably be all right. I mean, okay. That's, okay. Again, we're riding around anyway. It's not, he's not trying to sell me a giant load. Mm. Um, and so we pull over to his his house, pull up, and I'm assuming that this jackass sitting next to me knows him well, but he just knows he's a crip, which is not helpful to me. If you don't know this guy, mm-hmm. I don't want to just go in some dude's house, but he trusts me enough to invite him to this house because I'm T. I'm yeah. the guy that people have heard about. Yeah. So we get in there and the first thing happens, we unlock the burglar bar, open the door, step in. It's a typical trap. You know, you got a couch, a table with some weights and a gun and then a big screen TV and like nothing else. Yeah, and no, and no that's else, a trap right? house, baby. So uh, I stand there and we, no sooner did we start having a conversation about what he had, I hear something eerily familiar. And it just so happens to be my own voice on an episode of Cops from 1999. Oh, you got to realize I'm in it. This isn't the era of, Hey, you have 4,000 channels to choose from. This is like, you got four channels to choose from Mm. plus a UHF. So these fools all watch cops. I mean, in jail, it's all you, that's all you watch. Yeah. I was thinking, Oh my gosh. And this, to this day, it's funny because I, even when I'm trying to write the book, I can't even make up what I said. I use the word filibuster because I just, crap my pants and started talking and I must have been maniacal. Yeah, you're like, hey, what happened with that game? Yes. Uh, yeah, I man. The, I- <laughs> and how do you kill time? I'm like, dude, how long is this episode? I think the Nationals are going. on, dude. You should see what's going on with them. <laughs> it was totally ridiculous. That scared me to death because mm-hmm. that, I, I can prepare for, man, if somebody pulls down, pull, draws down or if somebody, you know, tries to threaten me or what I, those things you can sort of prep for. Mm-hmm. This Nothing could have prepared me for this. And I'm sure I act like a, a panicky wuss. Mm. Uh, my guy ends up getting something. I don't even know what. It was some small nominal amount because it eventually goes to a commercial. And I'm just looking around thinking, this sucker's going to kill me right here. Because, I mean, it's literally, I'm looking at you and I'm looking at you on TV. It's the same. It's a life-size picture of you. You were a uniform cop yeah. in the show? Which is show. the only thing that saved me. Because a uniform cop in the show, when you see a dude in uniform, you just see a dude in uniform. It looks totally different, right? It, yeah. And, of course, I got the cop crop and all that kind of yeah. stuff, too. So You're the 90s look. Now we're in the mid-aughts. Y- yeah. And, I, of course, I you know when I'm working on a cover, I'm not like a scrote bag, but I've grown my hair out. I got a, you know, a whatever beard I can grow. This is, yeah. this is about six months worth of work. Man. 
Well, yeah. I find I find bearded cops to be almost hack now. I'm like all undercovers have beards and long hair, and the, I yeah. feel like now it's come full circle. You got to look cleaner. You know, yeah. I'd be well, a great undercover. Well, I'm six foot six, but like. I'm so I'm such a doofus and so sloppy. They'd be like, "There's no way this guy's a cop." Well, that's He's- a great way to. I mean, you fit in by standing out because yeah. you you acknowledge that you're a tall dork. I'm and like hiding in plain sight. There. I'm yeah. hiding in plain sight. Well, that's exactly yeah. what I did. Right. That's true. You know. That's true. So, and I'm a nerd too, but I, I mean, I obviously didn't belong. You know, hanging out with the Crips, but um, got out of there. He did not recognize me. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Um, and wow. again, I left. And I was even asking my informant, like, "Dude, can you?" believe that i didn't even know what was going on and he didn't know either. he didn't even notice okay. none All nobody right. had a clue but i was scared to death so um what happened soon after that i had a dude that i was linking up with to get into some other the, the most difficult part about this whole thing is when i start leapfrogging from people to people because i'm trying to make gang cases mm. if you're supplying me with stuff and we're working together and all of a sudden i go down the street and i get it from joe down here then that's a problem for you because man i thought we had this what's what's the deal yeah so i would find every excuse to move on to the next guy especially when people start showing up late on me or something like that and be like dude you you know leave me sitting outside mm-hmm. this house when you're trying to, you're supposed to meet me. We're supposed to be doing business. This ain't good business. And then I would, you know, screw off and go elsewhere. Well, the, what I don't understand is like, you could just keep doing this. You keep going on and on and on dealer to dealer to dealer. What's the goal? You know, obviously with a cartel case or a high level drug case, the goal is to get the kingpin, right? What is, what is your goal? When do you say, okay, this is when I'm going to actually well, my go goal, get the warrant and execute. Well, and I knew who I was guys. shooting for is the main Who were you shooting for? I, I, my kingpin was the guy doing the 250 a week. Okay, yeah. And he was in the neighborhood. So that was my goal. I thought the more connections I make, first of all, I'm building a bigger case, but I have more people that are, might be willing to get me to the next guy. Okay, yeah. Um, and and so how, was, who's that guy? How did you know it was him? And how did you get to him? Okay, well, I've been, I've been knowing about this guy since I had started running warrants. I mean, I was catching him in houses left and right. He had family out here in LA and was definitely kingpin and then, kingpin and then, but I had no idea the extent, you know, of the organization or the level in which he was doing business. So I had lists of people when I was working out of patrol cars during the day and then mm. in the evening running warrants and, you know, doing informant buys and stuff. I knew exactly who I had several people targeted. I just had no idea the level that he was at until I started getting into this and realizing, mm-hmm. man, this is massive. I mean, it, I kept clawing my way through this and it, I was making, I was taking a risk by moving in and out of people. But if it's a gang case and not a drug case, again, that's what you got to keep in mind here. You frame this as a drug case, then yes, I'm going to stick with this until I have to figure out a way that you can't do this deal and mm-hmm. you have to go somewhere else. That's what you, what you do. But if I'm trying to eradicate as many gang members as I can from these this general area, then I'm still trying to find a reason to move on from him to him. And then I'm having to move up from him and and replay that process each time until somebody can get me to the right spot. So um, the first time I actually ran into that dude was when I was doing a deal with somebody and we were waiting in his driveway and they were having a house party at this place. And so I pulled up and we're just kind of hanging around in the driveway, a bunch of people out in the yard, a bunch of people in, in the house and having a party. So my guy goes in to uh, to grab the, the stuff. And then before he comes out, I see this blue Jeep pull up, or I was saying it was a Dodge Durango. It pulls up and it's like freaking Prince just pulled up and everybody, you know, worships the rock star. Everybody immediately flocked over. He had been laying low for some period of time, apparently is what I was finding out too, which is why I was having such a hard time locating him. Uh, but because he was feeling some, I don't know what the heat was at the time. Mm-hmm. But he pulled up and rolled down the window and I'm like, oh, there's this dude. So hey, hang on. Was, did you know it was him because all of these dealers that you were busting kept telling no. him, telling you that this was the guy? No, or, I knew he was the guy. How um, though? That's I knew he was the guy from the from the jump because of the the work that I had done before. Again, I didn't know how much product he was doing. Yeah. I just know he was the guy. He was the he, shot caller for that for set. The, yes, okay. exactly. And what was the set? What was the Crip set? What are they? Is it Hoover? Yeah, 
that four tray actually was the primary and they did okay. have now as i scooted out into the other part of there were some five deuce over there too right and they had their own beefs but mm -hmm. when you get to a certain level you're cross-contaminating a lot yeah. of that stuff yeah in the dope stuff you are. right so um i walked over like a you know like a sissy girl the same way and thinking man i recognize him by face so i don't know him know him because every other time i've spoken to him i'm in you know black mask with a you know yeah. keeping through so I just walked over the guys high five and then talking to him and this and that. And I was just standing there as the most obvious dude in this crowd mm -hmm. anyway. And he looked over and just kind of gave me a nod. I gave him a, I gave him a what's up. I didn't know if he'd heard of me or what, but I thought, okay, I've connected some way where he's seen me bound to ask somebody who the hell this guy is. Um, so while I'm finishing that other, I finished that deal off and the fact that I had moved from my other dealer because he was late, start this guy that I just bought from puts a jacket on me and I have an informant that calls me 3 a.m. something. He's like, T, T, man, you, you, you're you not going to believe this, man. You know, you put a jacket on you, blah, blah, blah. What does Which, that mean? Well, so you get a jacket that you're labeled as a snitch, not a cop, yeah. a snitch, yeah, right? So, and that was because he was pissed that I'm buying from him for several weeks. Everything's going fine. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden he shows up late a couple of times and I'm off and I'm working with his competitor. You're right. So he's uh, just mad. I understand why he's mad. Yeah. But to me, I'm thinking, well, this could be the worst thing because again, I don't know that that's why he did it. Mm -hmm. I don't know who has done it, but they're all talking about, man, you got a jacket put on you and that's the talk. Mm -hmm. And immediately to my head, I go to the cops episode. Right. So oh, that's what I'm right, thinking. Right. I'm thinking I am completely done. This I'm so screwed. The next time I went down there, it was the scary, scarier than the first time going back down there to see how everybody was going to, you know, going to take that. So what I actually had to do was once I found out who gave me the jacket and, and it was this guy again that I just left him. And again, he deserved it anyway. He's going to show up on time. You leave somebody hanging. Don't yeah. make me meet you there and sit like a right. sitting duck. So um, I just decided to forego my job and and said, all right, what what would what would somebody do in the situation? Even if I'm just a drug dealer, what would I do? And what I would do is beat the out of him. So that's what I did. So you beat I up the mother that was talking, yes. calling you a snitch. Yes. Wow. How else do I? I'm thinking there is no way for me to lift this jacket unless I play this game. Right. And so I got up at six a.m. And sat at his house until he, sh I know where he stashed his stuff. You know, I've been working with the dude and it was like one of the little pillars of the uh, porta cachet over his garage on the side. It was kind of a separate little thing. Yeah. He left a piece of concrete. and So I know he's going to drop his stuff or pick up his stuff. And as soon as he did, I just made a beeline. He's like, hey man, what's up? And then it started to beating the shit out of him. And you just smashed him? Yeah. Did you take his work? No, I didn't. No, I didn't steal him from him. Oh, you should have taken his product well, too. What I did was when he got done. So I just, I just punched him a few times and then did a bunch of knees to, in between yeah. the ribs. Yeah. And so th this is house, one of those little houses that sits kind of on a sloped hill. So it's set elevated a little bit. And so I had him uh, like in, in a headlock and throwing knees, you know, Muay Thai style. Yeah. And it ended up kind of doing this number by his head, throwing him to sliding down the front yard. And then I walked back up to him. I said, take that jacket off me and then split. I said, this is kick? what happened. No. You give him a final kick? No, I don't want nobody in the hospital. Right. We ain't going to go to the hospital, but yeah. So so your your goal was to 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 him up a little bit, but not actually hurt him to yeah, where he I mean, would have I to, to. Yeah, I wanted to hurt him, but I don't need... I don't need the police called. Right. You know what I mean? Right. I mean, again, I'm trying to do what I'm supposed to do. Because local cops, marked cars going through, don't know that you're no. working this job. No. Only only my best bros know. And they know to keep it shut. Because now, do you have to I go call. back to the feds that you're working for and be like, hey, I had to no. pull some police brutality technically? Hey, hey, <laughs> no. That's not a case. You no, know that's I mean? just some gangster. That's just, that's just a, a personal beef almost and that's just a but it's time. in service of the case yeah it is and it's it's in service of the greater right. bigger picture in this case and no i'm not reporting that and i'm i don't have anything to report for it other than i don't want to turn myself in you know uh i watched the dude kick in a lady's door and you know say oh man t man hang on I was just about, i'm gonna go kick that old lady something something and take her tv she was gone an elderly lady and i'm sitting there watching this dude kick in her door and take her t walk just out with her TV. elderly lady yeah so i tried giving him a description, calling, calling it in and there, and, you know, 
just perplexed the hell out of the cops that are answering. Like, I don't understand. You, you just witnessed somebody burglarize a house and you're calling me, telling me to, I'm like, dude, it's a long story. Just, this is who you're looking for. Never yeah. found that dude. I just ended up replacing her TV. Oh. I just ended up dropping a TV to her oh. house, but it, you can't, you just can't, when you're in this type of situation, I know some people talk about they have to be criminals or they got to, like I said, they got to do a bump. You got to, yeah. you know, check you for wires, whatever. You, you can check me for wires if you want, but you're not really going to be touching me. Yeah. Because And the wires at the time to their, in their defense, were just like the movies. So I never wore a wire. I so only you, had that open phone line. Right. You tape that crap to no, your chest. Crazy. Come on. It's that crazy. is crazy. Okay. When you're, before we move on, everybody that identifies himself to you that you get close to <clears throat> that you know now is a gang member, do you then go run their file, type in to the official file, hey, this is a gang member. So later when the bust comes, you can rope everybody in or how yeah. do you, how do you tie everybody together? Is it just your uh, word is good enough? Well, yes, essentially. Yes, it is. Uh, but I am doing reports with specific cause I, there's no way I'd remember all that stuff. Right. So yes, I am writing reports, but again, they're not going into the system where anybody can find them. Okay. I get that. Is them saying they're a gang member enough or do you actually have to get them doing something oh, illegal I see. for them to be part of the indictment? Um, well, it kind of depended because some of them just had gang unit uh, was able to identify. They can mark you as a gang member just by doing the stops. You know, for a while, they when they were doing back in the day with those tats and stuff. Right, they can arrest they would you stab, for- They would do an FI sheet. They would essentially yeah. stop you when it's, well, obviously you're a gangbanger. They would talk to them about it. They're not arresting you, blah, blah. They'd take pictures of their tats. Yeah. They'd be filed into a system. Right. And so- they would eventually connect all reports, whether he was in a vehicle that was leaving somewhere where they wrote a warrant or something, mm-hmm. but he wasn't arrested, but, and they would put all those little cogs together. So, okay. yes, there are different manners to uh, identifying somebody as uh, a right. Crit, and in your case, was the people, everybody that got arrested, were they all uh, in service of doing a crime, or did any of them just get roped into the dragnet for simply being part of the set. Does that make sense? Or did uh, all 51 people actually commit a crime that got They all committed charged? a crime. They all committed a okay. crime, but they, it was, you know, it was a Rico style case, yeah. you know, so everybody's mm-hmm. roped in for the same weight and right. whatever. And that's kind of how you leverage getting people to, to flip. Yeah, you know, of, course. of course. And I know that seems easy to say, like I would never flip, but all these guys n- know each other. It's not yeah. like in your case where you got some dude that you know is going to find you, who's got to cross the country to find you. Yeah. I mean, they were talking about people in your neighborhood. Down the block. Yeah. Right. So, and it becomes very difficult not to, when you're looking at, this could be 30 years or this could be 11 years. Right. And I mean, when you're talking fed time, it's, mm-hmm. well, it ain't my life, but right. I mean, there's, you have to really make a serious consideration. Eventually everybody would flip. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, so you got, you, this guy up. Did you get the jacket off of you? I did. Okay. I felt like that cleared the way. Yeah. Um, however, and now you got stripes. You're like, oh, this white boy went and well, handled yeah. it. Well, I just did what I was supposed to do. Mm. So um, even before I did it, the the one thing I did was go back to my enforcer and and his high man, the guy I got the quarter, the first quarter mm-hmm. from, and just said, hey man, I know you guys are you know in the same set and whatever, but this guy's you know trying to put a jacket on me, which they thought was funny. Um, Cause again, they know me. They're like, well, I don't know who you are. You ain't, you ain't no snitch or yeah. whatever. Yeah. Uh, and so my uh, first idea was not for me to do it, but to tell them that, Hey man, this guy is put, trying to put a jacket on me. I'm just doing some business. And this guy is, you know, trying to mm-hmm. get in front of my game. I know you guys are, you know, you're rocking that stuff. I don't know about that. I don't want to step on your game either, but obviously I got some work to do with this cat. Mm-hmm. And I just want to make sure we're straight. Mm-hmm. And so I was, my hope was they'll go take care of his ass and set it straight and make sure I don't have a jacket. But they were like, oh man, no, you do what you got to mm-hmm. do. Yeah. So they, you got to do what you got to do. And I'm yeah. Like, mm. yeah. So yeah. <laughs> then, then how did that, now this is kind of cleared the way for you to go at the kingpin or the shot caller, we'll call him. Yeah, somewhat. So eventually we get to a point where I'm really running out of people like you know, you're getting to a certain level yeah. where, man, if this guy's not going to just take me to the promised land, I'm, I'm really stuck. Yeah. 
Uh, and you know, there are times we're sitting in a, in a living room counting while they're counting his money and they're wow. counting a million dollars in the living room floor. Wow. So, that he's, kind of, so he, he's serving the whole area. Uh, he's it. Yeah. He's okay. it. I mean, this changed the price of a kilo for better part of a year when these guys went away because of the source, not because of the guys. Right. So, so the price went up yeah. because he's Quite gone. Bit. Yeah. It went up another five grand a key for yeah. a better part of a year wow. at the time. So, and they're, and they're getting it straight from the border. He, yeah. Straight he from was the getting it straight, border yeah. sources. Which was the craziest thing to find out how he would get it. He would, you know, if he gives this guy $125,000, he gives it to him and watches him drive off. Yeah. And that's how much know. trust there is. <laughs> <laughs> that's bizarre. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't give somebody 20 bucks that's a drug dealer and say, you know, you say, I'll mm -hmm. be back with it, man. Hang on. Uh, no. So this guy was thorough. He was not a stupid gang man, banger. He was, hand, he was hands off, but he was also one of the most dedicated gangbanger guys. He had come up through the ranks had grown up in that neighborhood, was ruthless, but smart. Uh, looked very, um, he was... An average, I'd say average looking dude. I mean, just mm -hmm. in terms of his build, he was fit and everything, but he's, you know, five, 10 guy, um, handsome feller. Were any smart. bodies, did you hear about the talk about any bodies that were linked back to him? Yes. Uh, and several. And in what circumstance? Uh, robberies, usually early. And there was one, like the corner store that I used to pick up my informant at, mm -hmm. uh, one of, that was one of his first ones. He and one of the other guys in my case went in when they were younger and robbed the store clerk and ended up murdering him. Wow. And then the guy that was my informant ended up being the one they shoved the gun to and told him to get rid of it. So he was the one, you know, he was the grunt. Again, my guy, yeah. my informant was literally just a a dude. Uh -huh. And what, what about like drug robberies? Do, do murders in the service of drug robberies? They I imagine do. that happens. Yeah. It like does that's happen. a way to like elevate yourself. Like if you're a, a young guy that wa is aspiring to be a high level drug trafficker, yeah. you can't go get a loan. So, you know, I mean, look, I was involved in stuff like this, not Sorry. murders, my God, but like, that's the way to get a bank to get yourself right. in the game is to take somebody's stash. Right. Well, these guys were doing that, but not amongst themselves. No, you not, go outside the neighborhood. Right. We had one dude in this case who was actually ripping off my kingpin and his second in command and actually went to his parents' house because he thought he had his stuff in this parents' attic <sighs> and went and robbed his parents. Wow. And that dude got tortured. That dude was like, I know you've you've been around the cartel types, mm. and this was more of a cartel murder. And these dudes waited for him to come in, beat the crap out of him, tied him up, hog tied him, and then shoved a gun up his ass and fired. Ooh. I mean, they did not play, it, and they dumped God. his body over and across town. These are black guys. That was the Como the Lake. Say so, yeah, yeah, black these guys black doing guys. this. Wow. But again, this how do you trace that to the guy? Except that. Duh. I mean, you went yeah. to his parents' house. How do we know that that he gave the order? Yeah, I tried really hard because uh, the two guys that got pinned up with the murder were in the county, and eventually, you know, I was trying to get them to flip. You know, this is after the case had resolved, and I would go visit them and try to figure out, man, how how can I convince you? Because mm -hmm. they didn't get paid either. Because they got arrested and they didn't get paid. They were supposed to get twenty k to take care of this, right? Thing. And so I was trying so hard to connect that. But again, I, I couldn't, I, I can only do what I can do. So you, you know? never actually ended up solving that murder. Well, it was solved because the two guys that did it got arrested for it. But the guy that called it never got. Okay. Touched. I don't want to bury it though. Cause I want to, you know, this is obviously going to conclude with arrests and convictions. Um, okay. So this guy is a very successful crip slash drug trafficker. And that sounds like that's how you become a shot caller of a crip set or a gang set is by being the richest, by being I mean, ruthless, but by having the most money. I mean, step out of a gang. I mean, think of the world in general. Of course. Uh, thank you. Do, do Mexican like drug, do, do you think he was picking up directly from cartel people or from Mexican American gangs who are connected? I with don't, I don't even know people? if he was a gang or a cartel. I just know that he was the Mexican that was getting it across the border. Yeah. Okay. So I actually can't tell you okay. one way or the other. If Does he was the DEA gang. ever step in? Like after you bust a whole gang squad and this one guy is a certain yes. weight, do they ever come to you and say, Hey, we want to 
we yeah. want to take this adopt, this, adopt this into a cartel case. Yeah. Did they yeah. end up doing that? They took some of my smaller peripheral deals there. Yeah. And I don't know that anyone was able to, to connect. Cause again, I only had one dude that knew that. And my mm. connection to him was so anticlimactic anyway, cause he, he had uh, what they call a four tray day, which is on April 3rd. They have a family picnic mm. in this big park that bordered where the fishbowl was and everything. Mm -hmm. And the U.S. attorney that I've been working with was, basically drew the line. He said, we have, we have all these characters, and this is a, a huge case. I have to prosecute all these things, so we got to cut it off. <laughs> when I walked in that office, man, both the FBI agent and he were, she was just sitting there like this. I was like, what are you going to tell me? Oh. So he wanted to cut it off because we can't do this forever. Right. You know, I probably would have gotten him and then tried to figure out where the Mexican was. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and he was just saying, look, we've got 51 people on a docket. Right. Like, where do we stop? We right. didn't have 51 at the time, but how long did this take? How long is this going on? Gone on now? 18 months, 18 months. Okay. And you're still lone wolf in it. Still you lone took down wolf in it, man. All these people. But that's almost the only way you can do this, I'll right. be honest with you. Right. It's, and and I say how many, lone wolf. I, I wasn't the lone wolf in the movies, you know, like I said, doing it and, you know, living the life and whatever. You know, I you've heard the the crazy things I've done, but it wasn't anything that was gonna, you know, put me in jail or something mm -hmm. or get me addicted or whatever. So I'm not trying to claim I was that, but it was literally it was a different life because it was I was the only guy. So yeah. when somebody calls and says, hey, man, uh, T's coming back from Waco. And he's going to be back in two hours. You want to meet up? And I'm, I just get out of bed and say, yeah, sure, I do. And then drive out there. So it was, for me, mentally, as exhausted as I was, it was probably time anyway. Yeah. So I asked for a week. I said, look, four trade day is coming up. They're having this big family picnic. Let me go out and try to do my thing. I'm going to grab my informant. We're going to go out and try to just see, because I knew everybody would be there. Right. This is the, the and he's putting it on. He got a city permit for it. What is this Kingpin's name? Can you say and, his name? Yeah. Yeah. He, yeah. Uh, in the book, I call him. Oh my gosh. What was his street I, name? Can you say his street name? Like his yeah, actual street name? Street is name? What I was, well, the, the, here's the big problem I ran into with the first book. I used all their real names and, uh, but switched characters. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thinking, okay. Well, this will show that this is legit. Yeah. Um, and then that caused all kinds of drama because then, you know, people were coming out of the woodwork saying, man, you're saying so-and-so did this. And, you know, I want to know if they get out, I'm not giving them their kids back and all this. I'm like, look, I said in the beginning of the book that I've switched names, but I used real names because I don't have to be creative for that. These are the names those guys had, you know. Okay, so you can't remember his so, street name even. Well, I remember it. Can I you just say his, what's his street name? I just want to give some, so people can follow along. Like, what was... Can you give I'm us the disappointed name? that I can't remember what I changed it to in the second book because I changed it again to a. Uh, it was. This is embarrassing. But you can't even remember his actual. Well, street I remember name. his actual. You, street can, name. can you say it? Well, I'd rather not say it because again, oh, I, I still right. live in that city, All right. and so everybody. So everybody, how the did drama you, that causes there when people are finally wow. identified in specificity it yeah. makes a big problem for me. Okay, so what was what was your interaction with him? So my finally. interaction with him finally was where there was a pickup game of basketball and he's out on the court. And so my informant's calling me I'm like, man, cause there's a set, there's like the park. It's hard to describe. There's a giant city park where everybody's out barbecuing, parked all on mm -hmm. the sides, every which way. And then there's a, a dead end out of the fishbowl and you walk across the dead end. There's an apartment complex, it's a basketball court. So a bunch of people from all, you know, all those mm -hmm. cats from that park, all the four trade guys were out playing ball. They get done playing ball, and then I pull up and was going to try to meet him in front. They had an apartment I knew where one of the his sidekick at the time had an apartment there. But again, it's like not where he stays; it's just mm -hmm. one of his spots, mm -hmm. you know. And so it was crazy. I had a bunch of people. I pulled in a bunch of people coming over to my car and everything else, and I'm trying to whisper to my informant, like, "Man, we gotta we gotta try to make something happen. This is this is a hail mary. This guy doesn't touch dope." Right. essentially he handles the money and then he's got people that touch it and move it. Yep. I said, so if we have any shot, we've got to figure out a way for me. To, I'm just going to, I'm just going to ask him if he's got anything. And my informant for the first time had something intelligent to say. And he was like, man, you will screw it up because of who you are. He said, think about this. He said, you really need me to do this. Now, and, and again, my ego is saying, no, man, I got this because I want this hand to hand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he's talking sense that makes sense because he's just a 
dude. Yeah. You know, he's a dude I've helped out before, but he's just a scrote. So what's your guys? Is it, hey, look, this guy has been buying here for 18 months. He's moving weight. You know, he can yeah. get rid of it fast. He needs a better price. Is that why he needs to meet the guy is well, because he needs. Well, we didn't even have cash at the time. We were told to wrap this up. So yeah. we had, this was the the last ditch effort was to see if they had anything at all. And this was the craziest part because it really makes no sense. Okay. And you'll know why this makes no okay. sense. So I let my ego go and I was like, you're, you're right. Cause you know, I'm not sitting here with 20 K. We're not mm -hmm. trying to do that kind of thing. We're at a, we're at a freaking four tray picnic. Yeah. <laughs> and so he goes up and, says, hey, man, you know, blah, 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 blah. You know, T's trying to help me out. Blah, blah, and, and in celebration of the day, everybody's just in a mood. Mm -hmm. Everybody's communing and hanging out, eating and drinking. Drinking 40s. Drinking a ton. Sorry. And this is nightfall too. So this is like, it's nighttime. Yeah. And I'm literally just parked. I'm essentially illuminating them with my headlights as I, you know, was pulled mm -hmm. up and they were talking. And he got the dude to freaking score him a gram of crack cocaine. Oh, the kingpin. The kingpin. Because he was drunk and he was merry. He just decided to do something so stupid. My guy just looks the part. He's just a dude. He's, you yeah. know, a nothing. Harmless. But if I had gone up and asked and said, I could spare a couple hundred, he would have just thought, what the hell? Right. For me to ask would, wouldn't have made any sense. Because by then, everybody knows who I am. I know, certainly know who he is, but yeah. I know, you know, my name had gotten around. So that was essentially a way to draw him into the case. And that's and then, enough? One that's, gram of crack. So it's enough to it's enough to associate him because he's, again, this is, we're making a dope case. If the conspiracy is that he doesn't end up getting, you know, this massive weight, it remains to be seen because then during the roundup, you know, you had 200, coordinate 200 law enforcement people to go out. You had 51 people. So, so is that the this. most you got on him? That's the most I got on him. Yes. That is okay. It. So was your thought, well, okay, maybe we'll make the bust, we'll rope him into the conspiracy, but we'll try to get a bunch of people to flip and identify him as the man? Yes. Okay, how, gotcha. That is how it works. God, so, I and been and a lawyer. <laughs> and we and we got the raids because, you know, if you go and raid his house, whatever you find. So I found okay. stuff on his computer. They found a little bit of weight. They found a little bit of cash. Okay, hang on. So back up because this is now we've, we're 18 months. You You finally got at least a little something on... The kingpin or the alleged yeah, kingpin. Right. He's at least a part of the. So you go back to the feds and say, okay, now it's time. How do they coordinate, uh, you know, a 51 man bust? <sighs> man, it was a. How long does it take experience. and how many people are involved? So it took a couple of weeks and we sat up overnight, like for two or three different nights. The night leading up to the actual bust, we were there almost no sleep, essentially yeah. writing, writing warrants for specific locations where we thought the people were, you have to figure out who's where. And, you know, the fed paperwork is lengthy. Mm -hmm. So we're up at the U S attorney's office, just doing paperwork out the ass. Yeah. Like here's this address. This is where this individual, this is, is who we're be. looking for. This is what we're looking for. Yeah. I mean, you got to, you know, do a proper warrant. It's they're wanted. The person is wanted, but we also want to include any, you know, drugs, gang associated, uh -huh. paraphernalia, blah, blah, all that kind of stuff. Get all that stuff signed off on. And, then essentially set up, we set up in a gymnasium of a high school with 200 plus law enforcement that's our, you know, Fort Worth SWAT and gang units and all that stuff. Guys that, um, guys from DEA, mm -hmm. guys from the U.S. Marshal's office, guys from other agencies that worked with task forces. Yeah. Just packed it full. Right. And they just, you know, they're putting up on, and now for me, this is new to me. Right. So this part of it, and it was freaking weird that it was ending. I was already in a weird mental space right. at that point. How did that feel? It's almost like you're completing uh, like this a book. It was right. It it's was the end of a journey. Yeah, it's, it was, were you sad? Yes. Yeah, you sad. must have been. I was sad and relieved and and nervous because yeah, I was. They were about to find out. Yeah. So did you feel bad? Did were any of the guys? Could, I mean, you must have, right? Because you you spoke on their behalf. No were question. They, like, were there any of them where you're like, I I, I feel bad that they're going to go away? Absolutely, got, I absolutely did. Now, which is why for those people, I offered to testify on their behalf mm -hmm. in terms of their character and their potential to do right, yeah. whatever I knew how they acted. Did you go apologize to the guy you beat up and you're like, hey man, you're actually right. <laughs> I was. A Snitch. I didn't get How to meet. How profound you were. <laughs> <laughs> Knock some sense. No, we didn't actually get to meet all of them because many of them were just like, you know, birds. 
you know, no, yeah. I'm not talking to nobody. Right. Other ones were like sitting across the table, it would be me and the FBI agent and they'd be sitting here and she'd be accusing them, man, I know you, you're connected with so-and-so, you get it all from blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And be like, no, man, that's not how it works, man. Tell her, T, that's not yeah. how it works. Come on, T. Yeah. You know, it's just not, not computing it. Right. And I'm like, dude, I, I'm on the other side of the table, man. I'm like, just tell her, tell her. I'll help you if you'll tell her. But yeah. And it's, I know it's a predicament to put somebody in, but it's really the only way to, you know, yeah. to eradicate it all. So is everybody, everyone's setting up at the gym. So they're wearing SWAT gear. Yeah. This was the meeting before. And then we set up for that next day. We're going to run everything in coordination at 6 a.m. So mm -hmm. we go to up to this FBI office and I feel like really out of sorts there because again, I'm used to running those papers and you know, yeah. I get to gear up and go do my work, but I'm helping coordinate this stuff. So this is old school, man. This is just like, it reminded me of the, the stock market floor. So everything's all quiet. We've got this long table with a bunch of red phones on it huh. all around these other places where guys are going to be calling in from specific locations and reporting if they have people, uh -huh. et cetera. So you're not going out. I'm not them. going out. I'm staying yeah. in this room with mm -hmm. all these agents, yeah. these federal agents. And, you know, they're like green light, give the green light on the radio. And then within, you know, a few minutes, you start hearing people calling in and reports over the radio and everything. And they got all these dry erase boards and they're putting X's over mug shots. And they're wow. saying, you know, six guns and blah, blah, blah. And so-and-so is running and they uh -huh. think so-and-so is at this place. It was like the stock room floor. It was insane for me. It was wow. a surreal experience yeah. just watching this old yeah. school phones go to work. That's pretty amazing. It was, it was really fascinating because yeah. again i i that's the only time i've ever worked with the feds was mm -hmm. th those whatever it wasn't even the full 18 months because mm -hmm. i'd only done six seven months of that you know was right. was done in the so did you department. get everybody that was in the indictment did you arrest everybody that day or did no. anybody okay we got 27 the first day oh wow so did the people flee or they just weren't in the spots you thought Dude, they were once in? you heard if you were a part of this and once you heard uh t was a cop and they did this big roundup and they've got a bunch Man, it became very difficult. That was a super difficult transition period for me because yeah. now I'm just hanging out there and these, there's however many more people, another, you know, almost 20, some, almost 25 people out there that know who I am now. Yeah. Right. And so uh, it was super stressful. So did you have to, is that when your wife and kid were sleeping in the car with you and not, you were, that's when them go it home? started. That's yeah. when it started, man. The threats, most of the threats came when guys had been in jail and denied a bail. Yeah. Um, and realized that the time was significant. Why were they denied bail? Because they had sheets or they were on probation? Gangs, man. Yeah. Oh, so if you have a gang profile, yeah. you can be denied and, bail for that? Yeah. And there's each of those folks, uh, we had to actually testify. I say we, but the FBI agent actually did the testimony for their being held without bond. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Uh, and in each case, you have to pull up individual specific yeah. reasons why uh -huh. they cannot get out because it's not just a, you know, we get, nobody gets bail. Right. So everybody gets their individual opportunity. Oh, I see. Okay. And so we did, we had to pull all those elements of the crime they did or, or connect them to gangs right. and all that kind of different right. stuff. Yeah. Their, their paperwork, their sheet. And since it was a conspiracy, priors. I think it was probably easier since they knew everyone was associated in one way or the other. Once yeah. you start really painting that picture, it's easier to rely on the fact that, well, the, all these folks don't have bonds and this is why this person's attached to this yeah. group. And yeah, so probably most people didn't get yeah. bailed out. So a lot of people are getting arrested and then, you know, thinking they're going to go do walk through with their money and then they don't, and then they sit and then they realize, wow, we're looking at 35 years. Then it kind of turns into a bigger deal. And then we had all kinds of drama in the jail with right. threats amongst one another. Yeah. Yeah. Did, did. Okay. Um, back to the raid itself. Did you get the kingpin the first day? Um, we did. Yep. Okay. Where was he at? He was, he was at his house where okay. we expected him to gotcha. be. Gotcha. But he, he was had, probably clean though, right? He had a little bit of stuff. He had a couple of weapons that were in the house, of yeah. course, um, and had a little bit of a weight, but it wasn't like anything significant. Again, right. it wasn't, you know, where you keep your stuff. Right. So. But the guns are still illegal though. I'm right. sure. All so that's still enough to, now you got another charge. On. Computer, there was on. stuff on his computer that was gang affiliated writings and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So all that stuff was used as okay. evidence. And then how long did it take to arrest the the rest of the people that weren't there the day of the raid? That's rain? a good question, but I want to say, man, at least at least three weeks to a month. So it's, I mean, because, yeah. you know, the people that kind of knew yeah. were easier to find. And then if whose job is it? Were, is it the U.S. Marshals or whose job is it? Primarily. To people that have warrants out, active warrants, the people are- Primarily. The, okay. The, uh, however, since they had active 
wanted warrants, we leveraged our own department and stuff for that stuff too. So yeah. whoever, I mean, you know, you have an active warrant. A How do you warrant, find so. somebody that's got a warrant out? You go to their parents' house, you just look up all the info you can, and then just start trying to yeah, get people I mean, to tell you? Yeah, and you're tracing numbers. I mean, the U.S. Marshals have really great resources. Okay, so because they're federal, so they like can ping cell phones if you have a- You can write a warrant to do that, and then it takes no time to do it. You yeah. know, getting the warrant is the difficult part. When you're working with a NARC unit in a you know, munip a municipality, you need to write that paper and it takes 30 days to get a phone company to, 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 to get some of the stuff. To get yeah. actually a wire. Yeah. And we start getting people talking about murder cases and stuff like that. It becomes a whole lot easier to be able to justify getting some of uh -huh. these guys pinged. Um, but again, it's, it's just going out and doing grunt work. You're right. just going to knock on doors and talking to people. There are neighbors of neighbors. There are, yeah. And I'm sure know. a lot of people from the neighborhood were willing to cooperate Yes. I mean, a lot of people claim not, to, I'll tell you, a lot of guys that shut up, I was the most disappointed in because really the key people ended up talking. Uh, and okay. So uh, you get everybody in there. When do you start sitting down right away with people? So were you part of that? Yes. So you were sitting down well, when with, they were willing to sit down. Some right. of them again, were like, I'm not meeting with nobody. You talk to my attorney. I'm not saying nothing. And you, and you say, well, we're presenting this case, man. You could get a downward departure, but you're looking at, like, based on your criminal history and your this and this and this, you're looking at 28 years. You know, usually stuff like that, you're thinking, man, this guy's bound to at least have a conversation. And there were uh, some people who said, off? Man, there were. It just was unbelievable to me. Some of the guys that I really wanted to give a break to mm. ended up riding out their full sentences. Okay, so the charges are racketeering- yeah, it's mostly mostly. Is it a RICO charge or? Yeah, mostly it's possession, and it's based on the weights that we get from different people that are testifying. That this is where I got it. This is how often I got it. This is how I got it. This is you know this is where they they got it, and you follow that lead. Right. It's almost like in a, a paper investigation at that point. Yeah, and again, okay, so I was this is my first one of those too. So it's dope dealing. Uh, it's it's crack distribution, cocaine distribution, weapons, illegal weapons possession. Yep. Uh, what were some of the other charges? That's almost it. But I mean, then what other about than, the bodies though? Well, the bodies, again, that's when it started coming over where you could turn over this information to, you know, homicide detectives. Say, so, man, you got a cold case here. This guy is actually wanting to say who did it and how they did it. And okay. So did some of those people that got roped up into the federal indictment get charged with state murder cases? Yes. One, we got one that was doing a lifer for killing a 14 year old. And, um, I'll tell you some, some of them I'm really disappointed in because some of the homicide detectives, we got some great ones. Mm. We got some not so great ones. And I'm learning more and more. I had a guest on, on my show, even that did, did 13 years for a murder he didn't commit mm -hmm. and only got out, uh, by the grace of God, cause he didn't have a DNA, DNA evidence, but had the dude found the dude that did it. It's the only way he even ended up get it out. Wow. And I find out that there are so many, not just lazy detectives, mm -hmm. but crooked detectives. It was difficult for me to get somebody to go chase that stuff down. We had, at the time, one single cold case dude. And a lot of departments have none. Wow. I mean, a lot of departments are just overwhelmed. If you had a big city, you're you're working murders. I mean, this is what you work. You don't have mm -hmm. time to sit down and pull old cases because yeah. you're constantly working your own. So, and it's... Very disappointing can, to can, see if, how few got really worked. It, but okay, this is what's this is interesting. If you are a if you're arrested as part of a gang indictment federally, but there's evidence that you were part of a murder <clears throat> that comes up, will the feds give that murder case to over yes. to the state and say, okay, you're no longer getting charged usually with a federal crime, so you'll actually go to state prison even though you were originally charged with a federal crime? It depends. You're asking me complicated questions of the feds, which I was only one for eight months. So, yeah. um, or 12 months, sorry. Um, I mean, they could do whatever they, they want they to. Can. They but, can, they can. Again, that's, I think the feds mostly will take, they're not going to take a murder because it's a murder. They usually will send that to the, the state level because yeah. they know what to get prosecuted. They have the resources and stuff like that. Again, you're talking about FBI has what, 1,200, Agents or something, you know, for the whole U.S. So it's not like they have. The FBI only has 1,200 agents? Yeah, don't hold me to that number. Will you Google that? How many? It's not many. It's not as many as you would but think. But they have tons of 
courthouses and tons of bureaucracy and tons of yeah, but every federal agency ancillary. leverages those. Right. I'm just talking about FBI specific. Right. I mean, DEA right. is quite a bit bigger than that. But again, when you look at United States wide, I mean, it's not, yeah, it's not a ton of people. Um, so they don't have resources to take on a murder case. In other words, right. they'll pass that to the state level and right. probably get prosecuted unless they can tie it into that conspiracy. In this case, it wouldn't have made sense. Okay. Interesting. Fascinating. So that ended up happening, it sounds like. With some individuals in this case. It, they got investigated. I only know of one that actually ended up doing a life plus 40. And then the rest of them, I'm not sure ever really okay. panned out. So what were overall, what were, I know it's 51 people, but what were like most of the sentences in general? And did most I would of- say the average sentence, we had a vast majority were around, the vast majority were between 16 and 30 years. Most Holy shit. Yeah. The ones that got out really early were ones that I testified as to their character and potential to make themselves useful in society. Wow. And how many people were the, were, did uh, you testify for? I tested, well, all of them, all of them got four, out. Four though. Four like, people. Yeah. All of them got out early. Okay. Gotcha. At only different four amounts people. of time. Okay. Yeah. Four, oh, cause look, I'm only willing to do it for certain people in yeah. the first place. And then on top of that, and I can't blame them. I'm in my own head thinking, dude, I got you on this, mm-hmm. but I got to put myself in their shoes too. Like, yeah, but I'm knowing you for a year and yeah. now you're telling me this, but you're saying, trust me. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's a leap. So yeah. I, I really, I mean, again, it was, it was emotional because I was like, man, I swear I'll do it. You yeah. know, I did it for, I did it for this person. I do it for this and blah, blah, blah. And it's, it's just, I understand how difficult it would be to say, I'm really not the typical guy you think I am. Yeah. Although you don't know me at all, apparently, yeah. because- you know, I just outed myself. Did everybody take a plea deal or did any any of them choose to take it to trial? Uh, we had seven trials and nobody won <laughs> the trials. Um, I, again, it was, they were, they're all hand to hands. So I know it's like saying you, you, if you have a single person witness that saw something tragic or whatever, it's difficult to say they're going to identify you. I've spent time with these people. Yeah. I mean, isn't there playing Madden and sharing 40s half the time? Yeah. And so I knew exactly who they were and they knew that I'd done the deal and nobody was really denying that. So you were there in court testifying, yes, I bought drugs from this person, the defendant. Yep. I say on this date, this is what I drove in, did this, this, this. And that and was enough? Or did, were there was there other, other evidence against that? That was enough. I mean, I, again, I didn't wear wires. Cold game. I didn't have a team full of people that were listening in on mm. the deals. Uh, I had cameras. And at one point, I got a Range Rover full of cameras that didn't work. I have one video, I think, of... I mean, I can't tell you how many TV shows call about this case. And I they end up just passing because I have nothing that they can use for all their B footage. Yeah, right, know? right. Because there's no real footage of all that kind of stuff. And I wouldn't have been able to... I wouldn't have gone half this far yeah. with proper yeah. equipment. I had one thing that was a recorder. This is just when technology was transitioning into something that was reliable. I had one little recorder that I had and and it looked kind of like a phone and it was you know, a little square, looked mm-hmm. like maybe a, like a pager size thing that was a recorder. And it ran out of room during one of the deals. It starts beeping on me. Man, know, I'm we, trying put, to, we put a lot of trust into law enforcement. Because, you know, you're an honest guy. I can tell after sitting down with you, you're, you know, but just your word is enough to convict a person in what's supposed to be a democratic society. I would agree with you more now than I even would have before, only because I see more how, I, I don't necessarily talking about undercover specific, but it's hard to find really good cops these days. There are really good ones, but they've, it's going to get worse before it gets better because cops are scared to go do kick-ass work anymore. Uh, is uh, it because they're they have tighter control? They, they have more some regulation. Some of it's tighter control. There's a lack of appreciation. There's, I mean, even in the DEA, they were telling them we don't want to do these knock no knock warrants as often. We're going to do this and this and this. We want to pass that down to the other guys to do no knocks and where you're knocking if they don't answer. I mean, a, a knock. And, and ask warrant, can we come in? And yeah. we have a warrant. If you answer the door, we'll come in. But there's no more of that fast action stuff. I wouldn't say no more, but a lot less. Because again, the liability and everything that happens that yeah. comes along with all that stuff, you know, people can bring up a, a racially charged issue just out of hitting these houses that I was hitting. Again, mm-hmm. and I was not motivated by 
race. No. That's where I worked before. I knew of the problem. Mm. And then when I graduated and started yeah. working undercover, it was something that I was passionate about because yeah. that's what I knew. Yeah. And I did, you know, I did some white dude cases and stuff too, but I just yeah. wasn't as familiar with those times. So, uh, so everybody does time. How many people cooperated out of the 51 people? And did they get time cuts? Yes. Because of it? Yes. Um, with an exception of a few people. I'm going to try to do this without using names because this still pisses me off to this okay. day. But so a couple of people had started to share information, which mm. was typical because everybody's trying to give you as much as they feel is comfortable. And then you have to kind of push for more if you need sp specifics or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then there was one of the higher up guys, not the kingpin, but one of the higher up guys, which is again, a big gangbanger guy starts threatening a couple of them with, man, I need you to recant what you said. Mm -hmm. I need you to write a letter to the judge that recants any information that you mm -hmm. gave. And they're trying to ignore it and he's getting angry. This is while they're locked up in like temporary lockup because mm -hmm. it's, you know, right after the, the yeah. roundup. And so finally he cons a guard into taking a note and walking it over to one of these guys and it's his brother's address. And he just passes it to him and says, hey man, this is from so-and-so. Which again, he knows he's trying to get him to write this recantation letter. So, of course, and, and this is, um, this I only know this now after the fact, but at the time we didn't know this was happening, right? So all of a sudden we got a guy that's helping us out and then all of a sudden it shows up that he writes a recantation letter. A few of these people write letters to the judge at the same time and we're just screwed. So you write that a letter mean, to that the means, judge. That means like, hey, I I made that I totally confession lied. Everything under arrest, I under duress. Or no, they just said I, I was totally just lied. lying on him. Yeah, I just yeah. lied on everything. And you yeah. said to the judge, the judge is not going to be able to take what you say anymore. I mean, you just, yeah. you've done, undid it. If they sent it to us, we could talk to them yeah. and try to say, okay, yeah. well, what's going on here? And, and he's like, well, my family's being threatened and everything else. Yeah. So his family's being threatened. He writes a recantation letter, gets hammered. And these guys are doing longer sentences than anybody else because they got hammered, which was already unjust because they'd already started sharing inf what little information we could get from mm -hmm. them. And then the guy that threatened them all shared everything and got out early. Holy Dude, it that still is pisses me off to this day. Game. So you're talking about the, you know, the new laws where you're trying to get, yeah. you know, people uh, compassionate release. Compassionate releases. So I'm working with some attorneys now to try okay. to get some of these guys out, mm -hmm. which is ironic too. But did uh, what happened? For I guess, reason. What happened with the kingpin, our guy, whose name we will not speak? He's out. He's out. He's out. The kingpin's out. He had a uh, an originally a 25 year, and then got some kind of. You know, when Obama did the the crack weights comparison and they yeah, which I actually understand because you Yeah, it's I mean talk about a race up law. <laughs> yeah. That's one of the last laws that in America that's actually kind of like obviously racist. Yeah. You know, oh, there's oh. really no more dis overtly discriminatory no racial laws on the books anymore. Yeah. That was one of the last ones, the, the, totally the one hundred to one yeah. crack to powder. Um, totally agree. It makes no sense either. So it's and it's easier to make a lot more weight when you're yeah, weighing it. Yeah. Um, so hang on. So it, did he take it to trial? He did not go to trial. He did not go to trial. And he was charged. This was as, years later. Okay. Was he charged as the kingpin in the, in the roundup? He was charged as the kingpin, but everybody in this case essentially got the same weight yeah. if they were connected to the weight. So they connected all this weight to him. What was the weight? There wasn't a, like a number because everybody has a different connection. So yeah. if I'm if I'm going through and buying from five guys that we can verify were supplied by you, then yeah. all six people now have that weight. If you said, you know, if you were able to figure out that every month, you know, you bought a, a bird and it yeah. went to these five guys and they did it for a month for the past year, then that's what you're getting charged with. So you're getting charged with a year's worth of work. A lot. <laughs> and, it, and, and in some of these cases, uh, they don't you sell know, drugs, they kids. Yeah, well, don't. I mean, the feds, the feds play by different rules. Yeah. But again, the crack thing helped that, that disparity in that law, which again was used to an advantage in this particular case, but not racially uh, motivated. Were I people think it's willing to, to, were people willing to testify against the kingpin that he was the guy? We didn't have people testify against him. Wow. So no, we had people talk on him. That's what I mean. Put it together, people, but he didn't go to trial. That's so. what I mean. Were people willing to, if he had gone to trial, were there people willing to get yeah. on the stand and say he was the shot caller? They said they were. Yeah. But you know how that goes. You never know though. Yeah. When it comes to actual time to do yeah. that, you know, a lot of people just can't do it. Huh. Interesting. So it sounds like this guy, I don't know if he would have beat it. 
He might have. I don't think he would have beat it. I mean, he had the weight anyway, and he have and he had guns on him when you raided his house. Yeah, I mean, so what was he? What was his sentence? Yeah, I think he got twenty five. He got twenty five. Yeah, which if he had served out twenty five, he'd still be in. Yeah, you do about twenty two off of that, unless well, you catch time. Right, and in the feds, you're pretty much doing year for year. I mean, there are certain instances where you can get out earlier, yeah. but again, he got that that drop just because okay, so, of the general charge. A lot of those people got lawyers that helped them get yeah. reductions because of the weight. Because again, my whole thing that pissed me off was I thought it was a success because it's a gang case to me. Yeah. I don't care how much weight it is. If right. it means you're gone for a while, great. N knowing what I know, hey man, this dude's does have bodies on him, but he's not serving time for those. But now he is. Then to me, I can justify that. Right. Yeah. But I also wouldn't be the one to balk when somebody says, well, you know, this is crack versus powder mm -hmm. and all this different stuff. And so I get that. I get that. So uh, this case was in what year? Uh, the trial started in 2008 and uh -huh. 2007 and ended 2008. I started in the case in 2005. Okay. Gotcha. Wow. That's an odyssey. That is an odyssey. How did it change your life? You started, you get these death threats. Do you uh, move? Do you? No, we didn't move. I mean, I, you know, I spent the better part of a year and a half doing some really kick-ass heat runs. And every time I'd leave. What's a heat run? A heat run is if you're running dope of any kind and you leave the spot, then a lot of times you'll hang a left and then hang a left and then hang a left and then hang a left. If somebody's following you back to your house, yeah, yeah. then you kind of know that you're in a bad situation, right? So you're pitching the stuff or making a move or whatever. Yeah. So, And I would essentially do that. I would make wide little heat runs to make sure that I went home this way. Because yeah. again, the disadvantage of yeah. working in your own city, yeah. my wife and I would be walking in the mall and we had just agreement that if I saw somebody, I'd say, man, and there's, there's Chump over there. And then we would just kind of split. Like we were walking with each other, but we would just kind of fade kind of off this way to where it didn't look like I was with anybody. Uh -huh. I would say, hey, man, what's up? We can greet him that way. But, you know, we had, it was the weirdest thing working in your own turf. Yeah. You know? And was this thing on the news? I mean, it's a huge oh, yeah. case. Oh, yeah. It was, and, and were you identified in the news as the undercover? Not at first. I mean, not at first. Because, again, that, I was undercover. It's mm -hmm. it's a uh, it's a thankless kind of job, honestly. Yeah. But the, you know, the FBI and the Fort Worth gang unit and everybody was doing all the press conferences. Again, it's fine. I'm not, didn't do mm -hmm. it for credit. Uh, and I'd almost rather not have credit for that anyway. I just, yeah. you know, it's just did you, how did How did it change your career? Did you get a promotion? Did you? Now that's, that seems so New York, but it doesn't work <laughs> that way. You promote when you promote, you got to still take a test and beat everybody yeah. else and whatever. So it really, um, you know, it was, some notoriety maybe, mm -hmm. but um, honestly, it really didn't. I tried to start another case like that because I now had the leverage and the internal knowledge and the workings of how the feds work and you know the things that I knew after two years that if I could go back and change, I thought, man, well, let's put together a team. Mm -hmm. I could have a team of a small team of people that I really do trust and we can do this all again. And I was- But you couldn't be on the streets anymore, could you? At least not on the east side. Of well, the again, I hadn't been outed yet. So I was yeah. I was trying this. You know, the media didn't know and these guys were locked up. So I was doing right. Mexican mafia shipments that were coming in through the Freeport outside of oh, Houston wow. and trying to, they were moving uh, dope and guns through that port and oh, coming wow. up straight through up 35 into Fort Worth. So I started a case that way and it just got so finger screwed the whole way that- I want to talk I about just, that on the Patreon. That yeah, okay. sounds fascinating. I really the Mexican mafia yeah. and the connection from prison to the street dealing is really interesting. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, it, you weren't a cop for very long, 13 years. No, I wasn't. I just- I. And when did I you quit just, the force? When did you leave? Uh, I think I was just so burnt out after yeah. that. I mean, it took everything out of me. Right. Um, and I, the only thing that I thought I was really, really, really good at by that time was doing that. And my wife is already so patient. I mean, she had a real job and she, she couldn't go to sleep. Yeah. And so I'd come home at four in the morning and she's sitting on the living room Ugh. with the, you know, with the TV on waiting for me to get home so she could go to bed and then get up and be at work at eight. And I'm like, we can't do this forever. So, um, and then when that other thing you know, started falling apart. I thought, man, she made me actually stay to make sure I didn't want to like promote and do a righteous police career. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm also, you know, I'm kind of myopic when I get into stuff, yeah. which is why I'm doing the stuff I'm doing now. I just, I get into something and I dive and everything else disappears and I just get into it. Yeah. And then when I just was burnt out on it, I just was ready to do something else. So uh -huh. I just jumped off into entrepreneurship and, you know, yeah. started the company. And then you started your company. And, and that's what made me just do it. I was just so fried. I yeah. just, 
Yeah. I, I was a worker, you know, if other guys are disappearing for two hour lunches, I'm, I'm working. Mm-hmm. So I just, I just thought, man, if I'm burnt on this, I don't want to stay. Yeah. It I, sucks to be a cop, it. man. <laughs> it really, oh, man. it sounds all, even worse than being a drug dealer. Oh, uh, it, it, I wouldn't want to be one today. I mean, yeah. people always ask if I miss it, even, you know, right away after I left, they, they, you miss it. I'm like, actually I don't, it's, it's like, you know, the remembering your first girlfriend, you know, you can't remember just those good times. There's a reason why it was your first and not your last. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You right. know, so I know the, all the drama and the politics and the mm-hmm. red tape and the difficulty and the long reports and staying mm-hmm. over and the, and there's a lot to it. And so I just, I was smoked. Well, I guess this will be the last question and we'll plug your book uh, and your channel. What happened to the neighborhood? What happened to the fishbowl? Yeah. So I went back, um, maybe a year later, I was at the gang unit and I went over in a little, uh, Ford Fiesta and went in and drove through the neighborhood to try to just see, I was going to try to see if I could talk to anyone. Cause again, some of the families were related still there. Yeah. Most of the people were out and they had newer little, like I said, they made a little flower bed. Somebody bought up the properties, somebody scrapped to where it was a vacant lot mm-hmm. instead of a vacant, of uh, a lot with a burnt up house yeah. or one that had bullet holes in the side. Yeah. It was cleaned up and Hispanic families were moving in there. Ah, uh, that's which great there for a neighborhood. Almost none were in there at the beginning. Yeah. So it's it was diversified. Mm-hmm. Somebody else owned them and was fixing up the houses. Yeah. And some of the guys hadn't heard about it. You know, again, you're talking to a Hispanic family that just moved in there. Yeah. And yeah, so, so, you know, I was here asking people about that fishbowl operation that happened and how the neighborhood's doing and everything. I was like, oh, I don't know what you're, you know, what you're talking about. They yeah. didn't know. Yeah. And which is the greatest reward ever. Yeah. Um, I won't say that it's perfect. I mean, there's still crime down there and these guys are getting out. Some of them are going back down there. Yeah. I can't tell you the number of people I've, you know, just done drive throughs to, you know, to show them where it was and ask questions and I'll have somebody on a corner stand up and, you know, signal to the, to the lookout or wherever they go, it's time to go. Ah, <laughs> that's not, tea. Yeah. That's tea. I'm not sitting here. Yeah. So, uh, it's, yeah, it's fascinating to, to see the growth and the other part of town where it stretched outside the fishbowl, uh-huh. um, also is fantastic because the university there has expanded and yeah. a bunch of people have bought up the properties. Yeah. Um, and you got to figure California migration has man. helped the real estate value oh, and sh- that improves the, pro- you know, but the Californians neighborhood. have always bought property in Texas. It's a lot, uh, it's a lot more economical to buy in Texas. Totally. Totally. Um, so, but it's, it's been fixed up quite a bit. There mm-hmm. are still areas where, you know, it's just, it, I'd say the improved areas have encroached on the Right. Poor areas, yeah. So they made them smaller. It's similar to the the hood over here, yeah. yeah. And you get you get over closer to the, the Compton area. There's a lot of you know nicer places that are being sure. put up, new apartments and yeah, know, coffee shops and whatever. Different than it was 25, 30 years ago. Yeah. So you feel like you 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 did your duty. You I did a good like thing overall. Look, it didn't solve everything. And again, I'll be the first to admit this is a cog. This is this is like somebody convincing you to go kick in a door and rescue a human trafficking victim. Mm-hmm. Well, that's great. You rescued them. Yeah. And then, then what? Yeah. So it doesn't, that doesn't solve the problem that helps solve the problem. Mm-hmm. So, but you have to have a counseling process and a place for them to, to be and, you know, the right people to take care of them yeah. and nurture them until they can get. And the same thing happens here. So once we figured out afterward, you know, the people kept trying to get me to write a book and I was like, I didn't write a book. They're like what, a, write a book for what? That's a lot of work. Um, and then once we found out there was 104 kids, you know, through all these interviews, there's guys in there talking about, you know, I have f- four kids and, you know, they're all within a year mm. and they don't remember the middle name of this one, but it's, I mean, it's just, it was bizarre. Yeah, and I thought, mess. man, so that's when we realized, man, the book could, maybe we could leverage the book to, yeah. um, to help the kids. Cause that's essentially the other part of the equation. There's probably three parts. You got to have the arrest that's in the middle of mm-hmm. the people that need to salvage the neighborhood, so that poor people have a chance to get out. Yeah, and then obviously there's the the prison mentorship and the yeah. prison programs and making sure that it isn't a ridiculous torture. Yeah, but the most important part is the kids in the beginning. If you mentor kids who have incarcerated parents or murdered parents, which are the programs we donate all the book profits from then you essentially are weaning them. We were talking about programs that teach them how to write checks, teach them table manners, teach them uh, how to wear a tie so they can go to job interviews. Mm. And, uh, you know, as well as just 
learning how to be a man of the house, you know, yeah. and there isn't a man in the house there and they, they counsel their mothers and stuff like that. These programs are fantastic. That's awesome. And that's what's going to keep this from being yeah. a cyclical thing. And yeah. that, that's why I feel good about, look, this neighborhood got cleaned and then we wrote a book and started leveraging the money from that mm-hmm. book and drawing attention at least to that very neighborhood. You know, those kids that were coming up now have a program there that we're trying to help fund. So they have opportunities yeah. to not, become gangbangers yeah. and keep the cycle. Going. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, well, I'll definitely buy a book. I'd love to support. Uh, plug it, plug away. Where can they get it and find uh, you? At, now you can get it on Amazon because uh, all the d- book distributors, you know, several of them gone out of business. So no more Barnes and Noble for mm-hmm. me, but it's hard to find those anyway. Yeah. So it's called Life in the Fishbowl and you can find that on Amazon. Again, all of the profits will go right back to the neighborhood for the kids. Awesome. Um, and then the channel is Uncommon Souls and it is on YouTube. It's on all the other yeah. podcasting channels and stuff also, but that's the, that's the primary one there. Again, it's just drawing attention to the fact that so many of us have more in common than we can appreciate. Mm-hmm. And, and I leveraged the experience that I had here in the fishbowl thinking, yes, I thought I was Mr. Uh, get along with all races and stuff because I was a musician in biracial bands and everything else. And I thought I could really get along, but everybody, uh, the consensus is everybody, you know, hates a, you know, criminals that are killers, right? Oh, I thought you were going to say cops. I was like, yeah. Or cops. <laughs> that, or cops. Now that too. <laughs> but yeah. And it's, but what's was like fascinating, cops. it's fascinating that these guys were, if you take the sociopath and remove that part from them and mm-hmm. the fact that they were gang banging and, you know, participating in violent acts, they were like dudes. Yeah. I mean, I was, like I said, you play mad, you talk crap about the Cowboys, yeah. you, whatever. I mean, we just enjoy doing dude stuff. Yeah. So it was a very eye opening experience. And I have, you know, people from all walks with very fascinating stories, similar to, to the, to your story, which mm-hmm. I think is fascinating that you can tie into other people from completely different walks. You would say, wait a minute, you have something in common with that dude yeah. where normally you would just be dismissive of who they are. So, you know, hopefully you can always look forward to seeing somebody that you would normally dismiss and think, I'm going to find a nugget in this. Yeah. Yeah. We have much more in common, much more in common than we do uh, differences. So definitely go check out Tegan's book, check out his channel, follow him on socials, uh, and then switch over to the Patreon, patreon.com slash the connect show. Just want to talk a little bit, you know, more cop stuff. I mean, that was a fascinating episode. Thank you so much for coming down, brother. I really, really appreciate it. it. Thank you for having me, man. Love it. All right, guys. Take care. <laughs>